Wonderful. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board. It is July 14th, 2023 at 10.02 a.m. My name is Jennifer Urban, and I'm the chairperson of the board. I'm very pleased to be here in person with the board um, and maybe one member of the public or two um, to welcome many of you um, via Zoom as well. This is our first in-person meeting in some time. Before we get started with the substance, I have some logistical announcements as well as my usual reminders related to Bagley Keen, the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. First, I'd like to ask everyone to please check your microphone is muted when you are not speaking. Second, I'd like to ask everyone who is here in person to turn off or silence their cell phones to avoid interruption. Thank you for um, uh, doing that for us. And third, importantly, um, this meeting is being recorded. We are strongly encouraging everyone to wear masks if you're attending in person. Uh, we're not requiring this, um, just encouraging it. COVID-19 is of course still with us and we want to avoid exposing vulnerable members of the community or inadvertently making our public meetings less accessible to them. Our temporary ability to meet remotely and still comply with Bagley Keene has expired and thus far has not been renewed by the legislature. This could unfortunately pose some serious logistical issues for the board's work on behalf of the public. Um, if a board member tests positive, there is no option for that person to join remotely. Um, and thus um, uh, that would mean that a COVID-19 positive board member cannot safely participate in a public meeting. Um, this is exacerbated by the fact that our meetings are noticed 10 days in advance under Bagley Keene, um, and we cannot easily reschedule, um, uh, particularly uh, when we have these hybrid in-person meetings, which uh, require a lot of resources to orchestrate. Um, that brings me to my second request, which is everyone please bear with us um, with regard to any kinks as we run the meeting. Those of you who joined us last June will recall that there were kinks on and off. We have a Cracker Jack um, staff um, helping us with logistics, but it is simply complicated to do a hybrid in person and remote meeting. And we really want value the ability for the members of the public to join us remotely. Um, so um, we have decided that we will deal with the complexity in order to increase accessibility. Um, in return, we ask that you please bear with us um, if we have any glitches. If that happens, if for example, the remote audio, the audio cuts out, we will pause to fix it and I will let you know how to let us know if there's an issue in a minute. I also ask that you bear with me um, having to look at my laptop screen um, and sort of hide my face in order to access materials for the meeting today. Um, this is in, in order to accommodate some physical limitations that currently re require an immobilizing neck brace. I realize this is not ideal. Zoom would be far better, but here we are. I greatly appreciate everyone bearing with us. All right, let's talk about logistics and meeting participation. Today's meeting will be run according to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act as required by law. We will proceed through the agenda, which available is a handout here in Oakland and also on the CPPA website, look under meetings and you can find all our materials there. You may notice board members accessing their laptops, phones or other devices during the meeting as I am. We are using those devices solely to access the board meeting materials if you see that. After each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for questions and discussion by board members. And I will also ask for public comment on each agenda item. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. And we also have a designated item time on the agenda for general public comment, not tied to a specific agenda item. And that's agenda item number 12 today. We have members attending online via Zoom and also in person. Um, so let me talk quickly um, about how to participate. And if you have any questions, um, uh, let us know um, and I'll be happy to repeat. If you're attending via Zoom and you wish to speak on an item, please wait till I call for public comments on that item and allow staff to prepare for Zoom comment. Then please use the raise your hand function. It's in the reaction feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you wish to speak on an item and you're joining remotely by phone, please press star nine on your phone to show the moderator that you are raising your hand. Our moderator will call your name when it is your turn and request that you unmute yourself for comment at that time. Those using the webinar can use the unmute feature and those dialing in by phone can press star six to unmute. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you. Please note for those of you joining remotely, the board will not be able to see you, only hear your voice. 
Thus, it is helpful if you identify yourself, but this is entirely voluntary and you can always use a pseudonym, uh, uh, including to input it into Zoom when you log into the meeting. If you are attending in person and wish to speak on an item, please wait for me to call for public comment and then move towards the podium um, on my left here and form a line, keeping social distancing in place if you would. Please move to the podium when you are called to speak in your turn. As with Zoom attendees, of course, it's helpful if you identify yourself when you begin speaking, but of course it is entirely voluntary and you are free to refer your, to yourself with a pseudonym or not to give a name. Please speak into the microphone so that everyone participating remotely can hear you and your remarks can be recorded in the meeting record. Um, as I mentioned, the hybrid meeting format is somewhat complex. So um, in case we have technical difficulties, um, I have some tips for everybody. First, I'd like to thank the team managing um, all the technical aspects of this meeting today. Ms. Trini Hurtado, welcome from LA, and Mr. Oscar Estella here um, in the Oakland office. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, if you are attending remotely and experience an issue with the remote meeting, for example, the audio drops, please email info at cppa.ca.gov. That's I, N for Nancy, F for Frank, O at cppa.ca.gov. This will be monitored throughout the meeting. And if there's an issue that affects the remote meeting, we will pause it to let our technical staff work on fixing the issue. The board welcomes public comment on every item on the agenda, and it is our intent to ask for public comment prior to voting on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment and you wish to speak on the item, please let us know by raising the raise your hand functions if you're on Zoom or coming to the podium um, and raise your hand um, uh, if you're here in person to let me know that I forgot, and you will either be called on or um, called to the podium to provide your comment. Uh, once again, speakers are limited to three minutes per agenda item, and if you are speaking on an agenda item, both board members and members of the public must contain their comments to that agenda item. Relatedly, I'd like to remind everyone of some of the rules of the road under Bagley Keene. Um, we can only speak about uh, agenda items under each item because we can discuss agendized items only so that the public has proper notice of the topics of the meeting. The public only can bring up additional topics when we uh, bring up the agenda item for that purpose, which I mentioned was 12, uh, item 12 today. But we won't be able to, as board members, respond. We can only listen. Um, and uh, dis, uh, we can, you can also bring up items for future meetings um, when the board takes up an agenda item designated for that purpose, which is number 13 today. All right, we have quite a full agenda today, and I will be moving the discussion along. We will take breaks as needed, including one for lunch. I will announce each break and the earliest that we could plan to return so that everybody can feel confident um, that they can take a break as well and come back before we begin again. Um, please note that agenda item number 14 today is a closed session item to most efficiently use everyone's time. I'm planning to take that item out of order and discuss it during lunch. Um, I'll keep an eye on timing and take other items out of order if needed as well. My thanks to our board members for their service and all the people working to make the meeting possible. Um, in addition to the team of um, uh, technical and conference experts, um, uh, today I'd like to thank Mr. Philip Laird, who's our meeting counsel today, Mr. Ashkan Sultani, who's here in our capacity as our executive director, and other staff members who will have prepared, have prepared guidance for um, us today, and you will hear, about, uh, hear from as we go along. I'd also like to thank and welcome our moderator, Mr. Kevin Sabo, and ask him to now please conduct the roll call. Board Member De La Torre. De La Torre present, Board Member Lay. Present. Lay present, Board Member McTaggart. Chair Urban. Present. Urban present. Madam Chair, you have three presents and one absence. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. The board has established a quorum. Um, I'd like to let my other board members know that we will take a roll call vote on any action items. And with that, let's move to agenda item number two, which is an update from the chairperson. I have one item uh, to provide an update on, on the agency's strategic planning effort. Last meeting, I was delighted to announce that the contracting process had closed and we would be able to start the process and it is underway as follows. The contractor, Sorello, is currently undertaking the discovery phase of the project, which includes 
collecting input from all levels of the agency and organization. So Rello team members met individually with board members and most of senior staff leadership in June and early July, thanks to everyone who took the time to provide their input to the team. Um, Sorello is now surveying staff more broadly and are on track to complete the discovery phase by September. Um, the next step for our purposes to my fellow board members will be um, for Sorello to share preliminary themes from the discovery phase with us in our September meeting. Um, and after that, organizational goals and objectives will be drafted for preliminary review with board members and senior staff by later in the fall. My many thanks to Deputy Director of Administration, Vaughn Chidambira, who for putting this together and shepherding the process um, so um, efficiently and capably. Are there any questions or comments from board members? Okay, thank you. Is there any public comment? Um, if you're here in person, walk up to the podium. If you're on Zoom, please raise your hand. Item two, if you'd like to make a comment at this time, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature by pressing star nine on your phone. Again, this is for agenda item two, chairperson's update. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands at this time. Okay, thank you very much. We will now move then to agenda item number three. Please turn your attention to the materials for this item that Executive Director Sultani and Deputy Director of Administration Shadambira have prepared for us as a budget update and some planning for next fiscal year. Thank you very much to both of you for preparing um, this for us and I will turn it over to you. We'll be providing an overview of the. Okay, let's try again. Mm -hmm. I think it's better. Yeah. Good morning. Executive Director Sultani and I will be providing an overview of the fiscal year 22 23 budget and spending. We'll discuss the current year budget for 23 24 and present some future plans for 24-25, our prospective budget. Beginning with the 22-23 budget summary. See the clicker's not working, Kevin? Uh, Mr. Stabo, could you all tab to the... Uh, And I think this perhaps the clicker doesn't uh, work from here. So we'll just ask you to advance. You can go to the next slide, please. And the next one. Thank you. Our total budget authority for fiscal year 22-23 was 10,852. This was comprised of our 10 million annual appropriation per statute we had 616,000 continuing appropriation from fund 501 and 236,000 from Department of Finance drills. These are routine employee drills, which included salaries, benefits, and retirement adjustments. In alignment with our statute, we pursued a contract for media and outreach services, but due to delay in, con in contracting processes, we sought to appropriate those funds for fiscal year 23-24. Mr. Soltani, we go into more detail to outline when he presents the current budget for 23-24 fiscal year. And that summarizes our budget for 22-23. Moving on to the expenditures. Yes. Personal costs are usually the biggest expense, and this is true for CPPA. The majority of our expenditures were spent on salaries and benefits for a total of 67%. It was 46% in salaries and 21% in benefits. Personal costs are followed by interdepartmental costs, which came up at 22% 22, 22 of our total expenditures. As you may know, we are continuing to leverage our contracts with DCA and DGS for services in IT, HR, fiscal services, and procurement. 
And these fees also um, include attorney general fees. 5% was spent in external contracts. Um, some of the contracts included economic analysis, transcription services, as well as strategic planning. And general expense items are miscellaneous costs associated with everyday operations of CPPA. Now I'll hand over to Mr. Soltani to present the current year budget. Thank you, Ms. Chinabira. Great, next slide, please. Uh, thank you all. Um, as I outlined in March, uh, in our March meeting, um, there are multiple places where the uh, budget is created throughout the year. Um, in the March meeting, we, we outlined that in our fall BCP request, we requested uh, approval for position authority for our enforcement team, for IT team, but did not request any increase in appropriation beyond our um, standard fiscal uh, drills that Ms. Jinabira outlined. At that time, Department of Finance approved position authority for seven positions. This included five positions in our enforcement divisions and two divisions in our two uh, positions in our IT division to support um, both the agency's IT operations as well as um, uh, the complaint system and and uh, enforcement related IT needs. Next slide, please. Following that meeting, um, the board directed. Uh, the agency to pursue a um, one-time cost of living adjustment, as well as um, a true up or past year uh, um, cost of living adjustments in order to reflect the intent of the statute. As such, the agency requested um, that cost of living adjustment, including past years, and I can outline what those percentages were if the board wants to um, delve into it deeper. In addition, we requested additional staffing for both enforcement and auditing in order to um, best utilize those funds and under, uh, undertake the agency's enforcement and auditing function. As such, we requested and were granted additional position authority for uh, a chief counsel in enforcement, a staff services manager one in the enforcement and complaint system, and then um, a legal analyst or legal support to support enforcement efforts as well. We also requested two um, IT spec two, or sorry, IT spec three, ITS three, uh, which we uh, found to be the closest um, in, in classification to what we consider technologists to help investigate um, and support enforcement activities. In addition, we requested an IT spec three uh, and a senior management auditor in our audits division. Um, to also support auditing and the audit function um, similarly. Um, next slide, please. As I mentioned, we requested in our uh, May revise a uh, cost of living adjustment under section 1798-19995. Um, the, uh, per the board's direction, we requested increase the agency's budget by cumulative COLA for fiscal years 21, 22, 22, 23, and 23, 24 and a one-time true up for previously unrequested years. In return, we re re received 1.1 million and 250,000 for culminative COLA and 600,000 for the one-time true up COLA. Next slide, please. In summary, we uh, the, the proposed 23-24 budget uh, appropriation was $12,060,000. Um, in addition, as Ms. Chinambira mentioned, we've uh, received a reappropriation of 2320, sorry, 2223 funds for our media and outreach contract, which we hope to have uh, a resolution on in the next uh, coming months. In summary, next slide, please. We've, we have um, now position authority created for 14 additional positions for 2324. This includes approximately 10 positions in our enforcement division, two uh, positions in our IT division, and two uh, positions in our audits division. Moving on. Looking forward uh, for our 23-24 prospective budget request, 
as we've outlined in the in previous meetings, uh, staff will prepare and propose a, a, a BCP request or budget request um, to the governor as part of the fall CP process. This process um, typically begins in August, and then the uh, govern, governor publishes the budget in January of the following year, at which point the board will revisit and review the approved uh, budget request. Um, our agency's position is that we will uh, maintain the same general staffing levels as we expect in this current year to fulfill and, and expediently fill the open positions. As I, as I mentioned, we have something like 14 open positions, a number of them currently active in recruitment. We do expect and to consider um, moving uh, contracting services in-house potentially next year or the year after. As uh, the board may know, we currently rely on DGF, DGS OBAS or Office of Business and Acquisition Services for our procurement. And we've had, um, we, we've experienced that as our agency grows, the number of contracts and the speed with which our contracts can get um, uh, approved has, has um, caused some delays in our contracting process, including our media and outreach. Um, staff is currently evaluating um, what it would take to bring contracting services in-house and, and at least uh, achieve tier one purchase authority uh, for the agency. We're also evaluating um, increased costs in litigation um, uh, that, that we may incur and uh, with an eye towards uh, requesting additional funds if necessary. Lastly, um, as I mentioned, we, we did receive the COLA adjustments for both past years uh, as well as the current year COLA adjustment, yet that um, process for the call adjustment still requires that we request it through our BCP. Staff will, uh, at the board's direction, um, potentially pursue uh, trailer bill language to memorialize uh, the automatic COLA adjustment so that it's not necessary to um, request it each year, but that it's automatically adjusted as the statute intended. Um, as the, as the board knows we plan to do this in the fall. Some or all of these requests per the board's direction. Um, we expect the, the January for the budget to be published, and then we'll have an opportunity in the spring and May to revise um, should any uh, unforeseen adjustments be needed. And with that, I'll leave it uh, to the board. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sultani and Ms. Chidambira, um, both for the, the presentation, which um, I appreciate. I think it hit a nice level of detail um, to give us information we needed um, without burying us um, in, in the detail. And for all the work that I can only imagine must have gone into this year's budget process, um, you know, as of the new agency, um, needing to ask for the true up and the catch up cola and all of that. I realize it's outside of you know the the standard um, practice and process, and I can imagine that there was just a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes um, to do that for the agency. So I really appreciate that, and I appreciate all the efforts um, with our partners in the Department of Finance um, and everybody. I'm leaving out <laughs> because you you know you have um, uh, uh, made this. Um, thankfully, fairly invisible to us um, in terms of the work that goes into it. So thank you very much for that. Um, and, and also for maintaining the budget for our public awareness contract, which we've all you know reiterated in multiple board meetings. And I know staff shares that we think this is a big priority. Um, so being able to, um, to deal with the contracting issues, which were not your fault, um, and maintain that budget, I think is really important. So thank you very much for all of that. Um, comments, questions from uh, Mr. Lay or Ms. De La Torre? Yes, Mr. Lay. Yeah, I just wanted to yeah add that, you know, good job on, on getting the cost of living adjustment. I would support um, getting that memorialized in budget trailer bill language uh, so you don't have to do it through the BCP every year. Um, a quick question on the, the IT positions. You know, I think it's exciting that, you know, we're pursuing that. And I, I'm curious if you have any more details on, you know, what kind of role they would be playing in an enforcement and uh, audits. 
uh, as a soft grade. Um, and as I said, there's kind of two categories, three categories of IT positions. One are the um, what we requested as part of the original file BCP. Those are to support the complaint system. Um, you, you all will be getting a, a, a brief presentation of the in-house complaint system, kind of our, our V1 um, kind of complaint system. And then um, we plan to grow that out and grow out that function of receiving and responding to consumer complaints as we require in statute. We're also contemplating our IT posture generally and how we manage IT. So that, that was one category. Um, the second two categories, the ITS threes that I mentioned, um, those are what I consider technologists. As you all know, I am myself a technologist. Um, I think effective enforcement in this space will require both legal expertise as well as technical expertise. Unfortunately, there's no classification in state system for technologists. They're, they are um, kind of, you know, they're either your IT guy that fixes your printers or, you know, there's some some sense of policy technology, but there's not really kind of these, these auditors and investigators as we see. So we found that the ITS3 classification is the closest um, of that um, of that role, uh, and we intend to provide two ITS three resources in, in enforcement, and they will be working within enforcement, and then two in the audit division under the chief auditor, and those will function more of a generalized um, informing the agency, providing expertise across the agency, whereas enforcement, as you know, will be siloed to within enforcement. Um, separately, I do intend, and the student bureau has been supportive. We we're hoping to work with Cal HR to at some point establish a technologist role. I try to mm -hmm. do this in federal government as well. And there's a lot of mm -hmm. efforts to essentially make homes. This is kind of a, a pet project of mine um, to make, uh, to recognize that this is a unique skill set. Um, I understand that to be a year or two, two year process at best um, to kind of create a new classification. But for the interim, we're seeking ITS threes um, to fill the kind of the investigator auditor uh, roles. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I certainly support um, expanding the available roles in state government um, to allow for this. It seems necessary, um, necessary now for probably 20 years so, <laughs> or more that we've needed um, roles like this. So appreciate your efforts there as well. Ms. Delatori, did you want to uh, weigh in? Uh, yes, yes, quickly. Uh, first of all, microphone. Is it working? Yeah. Um, first of all, I, I am really thankful to member McTaggart, who is not here today, for um, bringing up the um, possibility of obtaining the additional fund, funds for the COLA and the true app. And I'm very thankful to Mr. Sutani for actually going back to the um, office of the governor and, and getting it through the process. I know it was not easy, and I very much appreciate the effort. Um, I, it resulted in us having significant extra funds that can be put to well, uh, good use um, with a growing team and the needs of the agency. So thanks. Um, uh, second, I, I really want to echo the words of Mr. Sultani around um, the need for technologists, particularly in our area, privacy and data protection um, are so driven by understanding what is happening behind the scenes with technology and even though I'm a lawyer and, and we have very talented lawyers um, with us in the um, organization, the support of somebody with the knowledge of um, the technology will be fundamental for them to be able to effectively um, prosecute and also educate um, the public. So thank you for bringing that up and for, for those efforts, I fully support them. I have one question on the budget. When I was looking at the, um, a pie um, chart here of, of expenditures. I didn't see an expenditure for um, offices, for renting an office. And I wonder if maybe it's included within one of these areas and, and what is our current cost and what is our projection towards the future. If we think about moving to more of a hybrid situation where maybe we have offices available for our staff to be present at least some some days out of the week in different locations where they are currently um, living. Thank you so much. It's a great question. Um, so the current office expenditures contracts are encompassed or consumed in, um, in the interdepartmental contracts at 22% of the pie chart. We've spent on average 29,000 uh, on our interagency agreement uh, with the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation for the office space we maintain in, in 
Um, and we have a kind of a great situation right now. We have, as a result of that arrangement, we have office spaces as our headquarters in Sacramento, as well as offices in um, San Francisco here and in Los Angeles and allows staff to come in as necessary um, to those locations because DFPI has such a, a broad presence in the state. Moving forward, as we seek uh, to um, potentially change our arrangement and either uh, pursue in-house, kind of our own headquarters uh, formally, or uh, kind of augment our relationship with DFPI, we will need to build into the budget um, those additional funds. On average, it's about 10,000 per employee. And so we'll, we will um, build in those funds uh, as we seek to move into uh, facilities. We're still, for 23-24, anticipating not yet necessarily moving into facilities, but beginning that process, because as you might know, it's a multi-year process usually five years is the best guess, but the state is going through some changes right now because of hybrid and telework. And so there's some uh, flexibilities. Um, if the board have thoughts on um, on facilities, I think it's, it's, it's valuable. We find that as a, you know, as a digital agency, the fact that we came up during the pandemic, but also a lot of the space that we regulate um, is operates, you know, on the internet uh, virtually, as well as businesses in, in house, it's beneficial for us to maintain at least a hybrid presence because it allows flexibility. It gives us a strategic hiring advantage across the state as well, because people are value telework and it works quite effectively for us. So our team um, is, is, is right now telework and we found that really helpful, but I'm happy to take the board's guidance. And to your point, the um, contracting costs are currently consumed in that 22% and they may grow depending on our um, desire for, for being in, in presence, in, in, in a physical presence uh, more or less. Um, just for clarity, when you said 29,000, that was a month? No. That's a year? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, that's definitely. <laughs> <laughs> we okay. got a deal. And then $10,000 per employee that will be moving forward where we project yearly as an expense based on, okay. And we have foreseen that that might increase and we have a space to allocate that within our budget based on the conversation. Thank you so much yeah. for that update. Um, I'm not sure if the other members have thoughts on the hybrid. I, I fully support the idea of continuing some form of hybrid. I see the advantage that um, Mr. Sultani mentioned you can create in terms of um, making um, a workforce that's more diverse, that is more um, expansive in terms of where they are um, located. Um, but at the same time, I think that it is important to start thinking about some form of in office presence, maybe there's a balance to it, maybe it's two days out of the week, three days out of the week, so that the teams can um, just be together and work through things. I, I will assume that's particularly important for enforcement as they will be dealing with documentation that's quite confidential and maybe the at home might not be um, ideal. I'm not an expert on that. We. Thankfully, have hired somebody who's an expert and definitely should should be the person that decides that. But I'm um, just generally um, thankful that this is something that we're um, aware of, that we're planning for, and that we will take the time to um, develop so that it, um, we end up where uh, we still offer the flexibility to our employees while um, strengthening our culture and making sure that um, they, there's that, that connectivity within the team. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, similar thoughts. You know, I think the hybrid model works. Um, you know, as whether or not to go in two days a week or how that would work. I think the 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 idea about building culture is really important. So, you know, there's other ways to do that. Whether there's you know uh, organizational retreats or um, you know building that into the budget so the full staff can get together and uh, build those connections and 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 trust so that the work works better. So you know, I would support building that kind of in those kind of things into the budget, maybe with the savings from not having, you know, $10,000 per employee for um, one office that may not work for all of the employees. So um, yeah, I think as, as the agency grows more, that that's something that we probably need to revisit. Um, I think it seems to be working well now. It's a small agency we're growing. Um, so yeah, appreciate the information. Thank you very much, Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay. Um, so Ms. De La Torre asked my question, which was, 
Um, where is space in the pie chart? So thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, also, we do have the architectural revolving fund still correct, and we'll be able to maintain that. And that covers, it doesn't cover rent, but it covers things like remodeling. Um, if, for example, we wanted to um, take a more permanent, like have a more permanent space or um, remodel something that we're leasing so that we had a hearing room and, and that kind of thing. Okay, so that's that's wonderful. Um, you know, I really think it's in staff's ambit um, to think about the best way to organize um, work, hybrid work or in-person work. Um, I, you know, I, I really commend you all for the culture that you've built um, and um, certainly do take the point that as we grow, things might change, but I think that's very much within ambit of the staff in, in my view. Um, and I really appreciate you thinking ahead for all of this and stewarding our resources so carefully. Um, are there other comments or questions from board members? No. Great, thank you. Are there comments or questions, or sorry, are there any comments from the public? We're on agenda item three. If you would like to make a comment at this time, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature by pressing star nine on your phone. Again, this is for agenda item three, budget update and planning. This is the last call for public comment on agenda item three, budget update and planning. If you'd like to speak, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands. All right. Um, thanks so much to everybody. Thanks again, both to um, Deputy, Di Deputy Director Chidambira and um, Executive Director Sultani and all the staff who worked with you um, uh, on the budget this year and will work with you on an ongoing basis. We really appreciate it. Um, and we'll be looking forward to hearing about the trailer bill um, and updates um, when it's appropriate in our standard calendar. And of course, um, in any meeting as you need to bring it to us. So thank you again for that. Sure. Seems to be just with her microphone, there's a little bit of glitching. Um, oh, is it like cutting out? I don't know if it's your laptop in the way or just oh. your batteries. I'm not totally sure. Yeah. Can you say something? Sure. Okay. Good. It's great. Thanks for letting me know. Just let me know if it happens again and I'll stop. Um, so thanks again to everybody. And with that, let's move to agenda item number four. This is a legislative update and a discussion about authorizing the uh, California Privacy Protection Agency's position on uh, pending legislation. This will be presented by our deputy director. Oh, sorry. Yeah, let's give it a one, one second. Sorry. Oops. Okay. Can't look down, so I can't really get what I'm doing. Okay. Testing. Is this better? Interesting. I can't hear it as well, yeah, but it seems as though it's better for everybody else. Excellent. All right. Um, thanks, everyone. That was our first glitch. Um, let's let's hope that it's the only, but we'll be ready for more. Um, so please, let's move to agenda uh, item number four, which is a legislative update and a discussion about the California Privacy Protection Agency's position on pending legislation, uh, which will be given to us by Maureen Mahoney, our Deputy Director of Policy and Legislation. Um, please turn your attention to the materials for this discussion under agenda item four, and please note there are is an updated memo um, uh, from this week um, because the legislature um, is active and made some amendments to one of the pieces of legislation. With that, Ms. Mahoney, please take it away. Thank you, Chairperson and members of the board. I'll first give a brief update on the federal landscape before turning to California bills. So just a brief overview, it should be under five minutes. Uh, so first, federally, with respect to the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, or ADPPA, 
Um, as you know, the board last year voted to oppose that legislation in its current form over concerns over its sweeping preemption language. In my update at the last board meeting in May, I noted that the bill had not yet been reintroduced this legislative session, suggesting that stakeholders are still negotiating the language for the bill. And that's still the case, that the bill has not yet been reintroduced. So we're gonna keep an eye on that, as well as uh, children's privacy legislation and discussions over AI, um, but no major developments on that front. I did want to flag that we are monitoring a partisan bill from the House Financial Services Committee um, that updates the Graham Leach Bliley Act, the federal uh, financial privacy legislation, uh, but it has concerning language that seeks to preempt uh, state privacy laws with respect to financial institutions mm -hmm. and their collection and disclosure of information. Um, of personal information. Uh, so we're keeping an eye on that bill as well and its potential progress out of the House. Now, uh, turning to California bills that staff proposes to take a position on, the proposes of the board take a position on. Uh, these are all bills that I mentioned at the last board meeting in May. Staff selected the bills based on whether they directly affect the agency and its operations. Staff has a support recommendation on all but one of them. Brief memos on each are in the meeting materials, including an updated memo on SB 544, uh, as the chairperson uh, just mentioned. It has to do with Bagley Keen and teleconferencing. All have advanced out of the first house. They've advanced out of policy committees in the second house. And the next steps are that the bills, if they haven't already, would need to advance out of appropriations by August 15th, then clear the legislature by September 14th, and then the governor would have a month to make a determination on those. All of these would go into effect January 1st, 2024. Although SB 362, the data broker deletion bill has provisions that become operational at a later date. So I'll just quickly give a description of each. AB 947 would add the phrase immigration or citizenship status to the definition of sensitive personal information under the CCPA. I'll note that since the memo was published, the bill has advanced out of appropriations to the Senate floor. So that's just one vote away, uh, one successful vote away from clearing the legislature. Uh, AB 1546 would align the AG's statute of limitations with the agencies, so raising uh, the AG's uh, statute of limitations under the CCPA from one year to five years. AB 1194 would strengthen reproductive privacy protections by clarifying that certain CCPA exemptions. Uh, let yeah. me interrupt you for a second. Is there materials that we can use to follow the bills that you're mentioning? I'm, I'm a little um, lost in terms of finding them. Yes. Um, so I'm kind of going off the, the memo that we put together that should be in the meeting materials, but it looks like Mr. Sultani has some. To which bill are we talking about? Sorry. Sure. Um, so I just wanted to give kind of a brief uh, one line summary of each bill that's described in the um, collected memos and the meeting materials. Uh, so now I'm, so I went through 947, which adds immigration and citizenship status to the definition of sensitive personal information. AB 1546 would extend the AG's statute of limitations to bring it into alignment with the agencies. AB 1194 would strengthen reproductive privacy protections by clarifying that certain CCPA exemptions don't apply when they have to do with searching for or procuring contraception or abortion services, for example. SB 362 transfers the data broker registry to the agency and directs the agency to create a global deletion mechanism so that consumers in a single step can delete their information that's held by data brokers, similar in concept to the opt-out preference signal. Since the memo was published, the bill has advanced to assembly appropriations. And then finally, SB 544 in its previous iteration uh, would allow state agencies to hold uh, board meetings by teleconference, 
would require a minimum of one staffer to be in a physical location where members of the public could address the board. Um, since the original memo was published, the author has accepted amendments proposed by the Assembly Governmental uh, Operations Committee to sunset the bill um, on January 1st, 2026, and to require that a majority of the board members be at the same physical location um, at at least half of the board meetings in one year. So with the latter amendment, staff have changed their recommended position to support if amended to remove that quorum requirement. And that bill has advanced to assembly appropriations. So this concludes my, my brief uh, presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Mahoney. Um, the memos were extremely helpful. Thank you um, so much for that and for keeping um, track of, of these bills for us. Mr. Lay or Ms. De La Torre, did you have questions? Um, I know she just gave very brief overview verbally. Uh, I, I actually don't have one on these, but I did have a question about the GLBA expansion. Um, you know, I, I, how fast is that moving? And does, you know, I guess it's not, since we don't have a memo, it might be tough to get authorization to oppose that. But, you know, I, I have read that and it does seem to expand the definition of, you know, financial information to preempt a lot of what we want to do um, here to protect consumers in California. So I just had maybe a little bit more information on that bill uh, would be helpful for me. Sure, absolutely. Um, so in terms of the content of the bill, again, it's seeking to update graham leach Bliley Act, so adding provisions like access to information and deletion. But again, you know, the really concerning aspect is this uh, sweeping preemption language um, that seeks to preempt uh, state privacy law with respect to collection and disclosure of information, privacy policies, um, access and deletion, and international data sharing. Uh, in terms of progress, um, again, it's the, a partisan bill. Um, it has advanced out of the House Financial Services Committee. So, you know, it's sponsored by the House Financial Services Committee and advanced um, um, from that. Um, it was filed last week as a potential amendment to the National uh, Defense Authorization Act. Um, so that kind of piqued our attention. You know, it wasn't accepted as a potential um, amendment to be yeah. voted on. Okay. Um, so it doesn't appear to be that it's going to be added as a must pass bill, but you know, we just wanted to flag um, to keep an eye on that. Um, since it is uh, a Republican bill and it's a Republican House, you could see it move out of the House. And we wanted to prepare you that, for that possibility. But again, since the Senate is Democratic, it seems less likely um, that it would ultimately advance in contrast to a bipartisan bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mahoney. Um, and I um, appreciate uh, that you're keeping an eye on this. I think that it will be really important to maintain visibility into it and maintain visibility as to how it intersects with our 1798.145, I think it is, because we do have some exemptions, right? Um, and I think it will be important for the drafters to understand that if it starts to, if it starts to advance, um, that they may be doing more than they thought they were doing. And would just encourage you to um, let us know, let me know if it turns out that um, in your judgment, um, you think that it, we really do need to take a position um, and um, I can work with the board members to see if we can do a short, I can't remember what they're called, but a, one of those meetings that we did last, last July where um, there's, we maybe meet with a little bit less lead time in order to consider just that. Um, so I think we would all um, support um, your continued work on that bill, um, as well as all of these. Um, uh, with regards to the um, data broker bill, I apologize. I just got a little bit lost. You said there was an update. So it is. it has now gone through appropriations on the other house? No, I think in my memo, I noted that it was uh, currently in assembly judiciary, um, mm -hmm. but it moved out of assembly judiciary and it's in assembly appropriations. So it would need to move out of that committee um, by the middle of August. And then we would have to have uh, votes on the full floor of the assembly and then concurrence in the Senate before it would go to the governor. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. And the data broker 
registry exists, it currently exists under the auspices of DOJ, and this would um, move it so that it would be under the auspices of the CPPA and in addition to the other things that the, the bill does. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, it, are there other questions or comments on the board, um, or shall we ask Ms. Mahoney to offer her recommendations? I, I have a few questions. Um, on the GLBA federal bill, I will appreciate if we could get a memo to have a better understanding of what the bill covers. I have not had an opportunity to read it. I am I'm open to have a conversation about it, of course, and learn from our deputy director, but I do not see um, authority as the only consideration, whether we have authority to regulate or the federal government has authority to regulate. I think that a good or a better perspective from my, um, in my opinion, is, is how will consumers' privacy be advanced or not if, if that um, bill is enacted, if the um, consumer privacy rights are strengthened, or even if they are equal and we and we feel that that they, they have sufficient protections, centralizing regulation of financial institutions might not necessarily be something per se that that I see as negative. Um, it's been interesting to see how the industry evolves through all of these different, um, state privacy bills that have been enacted, and and sometimes it's it's not making the disclosures to the um, customers as clear as I will hope they they could be. So you know, it, it's um, I'm open to listen to um, and interested in in listening to to the arguments that you might might have uh, in favor or against. Um, supporting that um, that bill or or um, opposing that bill, but I, I just need more information basically. Um, and and then um, I'm not sure how that can be arranged. I don't know if it's an internal thing or maybe that's something that has to come to a different calendar. I leave that to the staff to determine and and the chair to determine. Um, the second question that I had is on the. Um, there's a set of bills that we receive uh, information for in advance that are privacy bills that are now advancing through the um, legislature here in California. Um, and I um, read the memos. Um, I, I find them really helpful. I, I see reason to support all of those. Bills. Um, the question that I had in my mind is there is a, a larger universe of privacy bills that have been proposed this year, and I was not clear as to why some of them have not received our support in the same way that these have. And what would be helpful for me is if we could distill a set of criteria that we use to decide whether we support the bill or we do not support the bill so that we have clarity from the board perspective and maybe an opportunity to listen to the criteria that just that you might suggest and and um provide our feedback on that criteria. Um, and then if we could see a list of all of the bills, which ones didn't meet the criteria and therefore were not supported, which ones meet the criteria and therefore we support. It's just, I think um, it will reflect better on us. It will uh, help us make the case that we are objectively analyzing all of these bills and taking a consistent position across the bills, regardless of who is proposing the bill. So for me or maybe um, member Lay, we happen to have a conversation with an assembly person or a senator that has a bill that has been proposed that didn't receive our uh, support. It would be much easier, I think, to verbalize an answer by saying, well, we have certain criteria. And if your bill didn't receive the support, it's likely because um, it didn't meet our criteria uh, rather than just having you know, the understanding that definitely, you know, we want to support these bills, but um, not have full clarity on, on how the agency is reasoning through through it. Um, does that um, make sense? Yes, absolutely. So again, you know, the rubric we used to select the bills was assessing whether or not they directly affected the agency and its operations. So if there was a privacy bill um, where the agency doesn't have rulemaking authority or the agency um, 
doesn't have authority to enforce. Um, we didn't think it was appropriate for us to necessarily take a position on that bill um, or that it shouldn't be um, a top priority of the agency as we're still getting off the ground and, and routinizing our legislative processes. Um, but I definitely welcome feedback from the board um, in terms of the criteria that we're using to uh, make a determination on these bills. And I think it's a great idea to provide a list of you know all of the uh, potential privacy bills um, so that the board is aware of them and it can better um, inform their feedback in terms of criteria. Mr. Light, please. Yeah, I, I I would like that as well. You know, I, I know not every bill they're asking for, you know, the agency's position, but, you know, as they come up, um, you know, I think you did tell us of some other bills that um, weren't tangentially, like we didn't have rulemaking authority over it earlier this year. Um, engage, you know, and I, I know from working on the legislative side, the agencies typically don't engage until, it's it's much later in the process because the bills change, costs change, uh, there's staffing issues. Uh, I know it, it's it's there's advantages to the agency, and I can tell from the other side that you know people would like the agencies to engage earlier. So um, I think it would be helpful to maybe not right now to get an explanation of like when do you think it is best for for us to engage, or when should we engage earlier in the process? Because I do think there are advantages to that as well in terms of, you know, maybe getting the drafters to realize certain things earlier on. So the language changes in a way that is helpful or uh, less hurtful to what we're trying to do here at the agency. So, um, you know, definitely strategic consideration. It's not always best, I think, to engage at the very end, but I can see, you know, why that's the case. Yes, I think it'll definitely be an iterative process as we're learning more. Um, you know, as you said, we did want to wait until the bills were um, in a more final form before taking a position. Um, but we've definitely heard feedback that it'd be earlier for us, better for us to weigh in earlier. So um, definitely appreciate feedback from the board and, and we may need to adjust moving forward. Thank you. I appreciate all, all of this. Um, I do think it would be helpful I wonder, though, how much of it would just be an academic interest um, uh, to have a more full set of, of the bills. I, I mean, I do think it would be helpful. Um, I would like to remind um, my fellow board members that uh, under our list of uh, sort of our list of um, powers and responsibilities um, is providing technical advice to the legislature. And that is something that can happen at any time. It's something, if it's technical advice, it's something that staff can do without us taking a position. A position is a specific thing, right, that requires the board to meet um, and have a discussion and take a position that runs into logistical issues with the fact that bills are just not baked for a while, among other things, uh, as, along with resources. I think that the criterion that um, bills directly affect the operations of the agency is a fair, objective, and reasonable criterion. I really agree with Ms. De La Torre's, well, I don't want to mischaracterize because it was more implied, I think, than stated specifically, but um, we wouldn't want to sort of pick and choose based on who calls us or, you know, um, uh, in terms of what bills we pay attention to, and that's a very objective criterion. I don't I'm not saying that we shouldn't expand beyond that necessarily. I just do think that we do want to be careful um, if we're going to sort of move beyond that. So I appreciate that being the choice for this round. I mean, I think Ms. Mahoney, you've heard sort of a request to think through the, a, a little bit more fully and, and advise us if you have further advice um, on that. But I would like us to um, be thoughtful both in terms of the timing of the bills and how resources are allocated and also in terms of how, you know, we decide to take positions or not take positions on bills. Mr. Sultani. And I'll just add that we also do get called um, kind of towards the end of the process to provide mm -hmm. a fiscal summary of bills that are determined to affect our agency. Right. And so usually the legislature reaches out to our team and, uh, and we provide that fiscal. Right. Okay. Uh, I just um I just wanted to mm -hmm. mention that and my my intuitive um perspective, which 
I'm open to listening to the agency and, and other board members, um, was that our mission should drive what we support. And I, I agree that our mission is broad uh, in terms of being supportive of initiatives that improve the privacy of um, California residents. So I don't see necessarily that limiting our ability to support bills to only those that are within the ambit of what affects our agency is necessarily the, the path that we should follow. Again, I'm, I'm open to having that conversation, but intuitively I will think about it from the perspective of what is our mission and does this bill further our mission? And to the extent that that's the case, I don't see a problem with being, being generous in terms of you know, providing support to multiple bills that de facto we believe will improve the um, privacy of um, California residents. So to give an example, there is there's an active law in California that um, deals with um, recordings of cameras worn by officers, right? That, that's completely outside necessarily of the scope of what we regulate. But I see that those provisions could be beneficial to the privacy of Californians. And, and there are so many important issues right now with you know reproductive rights, with you know all, all of you know a number of other things that I I am again just expressing my intuition and open to hearing the the more elaborated comments of the, our deputy director. But I will be initially very open to expressing support or things that may not necessarily affect directly the agency, so long as they actually improve on the privacy of the residents of California. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll add on to that. You know, it just, I, I, I get what you're saying. And I think, you know, in terms of priority, yes, the, I think what should happen is the age, ones that agency is directly involved with should be prioritized. Academically, I would like to know <laughs> all of the, the universe of privacy bills. And if there's some that like maybe the agency should Support technically, maybe not in terms of uh, an actual support, you know, like like we're doing now with these bills, um, at least in the earlier stages, um, can be like a you know also a priority, but lower than the the ones that directly impact us. And I, I do know there are political considerations of supporting bills that are outside of our ambit. Um, I don't see it that often. Um, and I don't know all the reasons why, but you know, I think agencies typically are a little bit adverse in, in my experience to to doing that. Um, so you know, there are uh, you know additional considerations, but I think as you know, as you know, as you said, I think we should prioritize the bills that affect us first, but also let the board know, um, maybe not through like this these as detailed memos, at least like a high level understanding of what bills do advance privacy or, or harm privacy, even if they aren't directly connected to the agency's mission. I just wanted my last comment is thank you so very much for all the great work that you have done. These um, comments are just meant to um, support um, what, you, what you have been doing. And I think that the main summary, although I know uh, Chair Urban is really probably much better at summarizing things than me, but it's a, a clear understanding of our objective criteria and, and maybe having an opportunity even to, if it's appropriate to, you know, vote on it as a board, I think will be will be really helpful for the agency to project um, the um, the great work that you're doing and and help other stakeholders understand where, where our um, priorities and criteria are. Thank you so much. And the bills have to be um, have appropriations by September first. So okay, it's a little bit longer. Okay, um, and then they will still be active, right? When we meet in September, in our regular meeting. I think um, they they'll be active. Maybe, yeah. maybe or maybe not. Right, um, if they're active, they will be active um, to offer a tautology. Um, yeah, and I mean, I certainly agree that you know our statute is very clear about our mission, and there are certainly things outside of the of the criterion of directly affecting the agency's operations that may be um, uh, uh, bills that we would want to take a formal position on. Um, I just would like to um, give staff the opportunity to analyze that um, and um, would welcome you know, any additional criteria that you would want us to discuss or think about. Um, and I think you know we're all kind of nerds and would 
love to see that slate of bills. So, yeah. um, so that, that there, okay. So, um, with that, um, my understanding from the memoranda, Ms. Mahoney, is that recommendations are currently for the agency to support AB 947, AB 1194, and AB 1546, and SB 362. Um, and then we can talk about the, the, uh, the one that we have revised uh, recommendation for um, after that. That's the recommendation, Correct. all right? Um, so uh, what I propose um, is that we will have uh, a motion to authorize staff to continue to support that suite of bills I just named. Um, and even if they're amended, so long as the amendment still is consistent with the objectives laid out in the analysis and anything else we might want to add. Um, and um, also to remove support or oppose if there are amendments that take the bill um, uh, away from the um, staff's analysis and, and staff's discretion um, is no longer consistent with those objectives. Um, and then we can talk about SB 544, I think it is. Um, but that's what I propose that we um, consider now. Okay. One second. Okay, great. Um, well, I haven't actually formulated okay. a motion yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, Fair enough. Well, you know, we might be able to do, we might, we could almost, but we let's, close. Let, we were close. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's make it, let's make it clear. Um, so may I have a motion to approve the agency staff's um, recommendation to support as currently drafted AB 947, AB 1194, AB 1546, and SB 362, and two, to authorize staff to continue to support those bills if amended, if the bills as amended are consistent with the objectives laid out in staff analysis and the discussion today in staff's discretion, and also to authorize staff to remove support for or oppose any of the bills if they are amended in such a way that in staff's discretion, um, they are no longer consistent with the objectives laid out in staff analysis and discussion today. I so move. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Do I have a second? I second. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. I have a motion and a second. And <laughs> I realize that there's, actually, I have to ask council, meeting council, I've never taped, I've never offered a motion myself. Can I do that? Like, there's a lot of pressure on Mr. Lay and Ms. De La Torre <laughs> today. Believe that's, okay. that's quite all right. All right, so I can pinch it if they get tired of it. Okay, <laughs> yes. great. All right, so that's the motion that we have on the table. And let's set that aside for a moment before we take public comments so we can talk about SB 544. So SB 544 is the bill that um, would uh, change the requirements under the bagley Keene Open Meeting Act um, originally to allow something that looked more like the measures taken during the pandemic um, to allow boards and commissions to meet remotely um, and has now been amended um, such that I think I'm going to just ask you, Ms. Mahoney, to remind us of exactly what happened, but I think it's that 50% of the meetings in a year have to involve a physical quorum of board members. That's correct. Um, so two amendments, first to sunset the bill uh, January 1st, 2026, and second to require that a majority of board members uh, have to be in the same physical location in at least 50% of the board meetings in a year. Thank you, Ms. Mahoney. Um, and this is not, I mean, this is just a question in case you know the answer that the sponsors of the amendments have for it. How do we know what's 50% of board meetings? We do have our regularized calendar, but we expect we may have to have additional board meetings. So for every board meeting that we have, do we then have to have an in-person board meeting? I think that's uh, one of the challenges um, that's posed by the the amendment and and why we're concerned about it you know aside from the fact that it undermines the objectives of the bill to ensure accessibility of board meetings you know both both for board members uh, and for the public um it's not quite clear how that amendment would work in practice thank you um mr sabo or ms hurtado can you tell us how many people have joined us on zoom 259 attendees. 259 attendees on Zoom. We have fewer than 10 people here in person. I'm just going to mention the 
statistics of our current meeting um, as we get into discussion. Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay, um, do you have comments or questions? Um, I, I would like to thank the members of the public that came. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. We welcome you. We're glad <laughs> yeah, to see you. Well, yes. <laughs> uh, but yes, there, there's much fewer than 10. Uh, I'll say that. Um, and I, you know, I, I understand um, what, you know, the Bagley Key meeting is trying to do, but I think since, uh, you know, that bill was first passed, um, yeah, the, 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 the need for uh, physical only participation has, has really lessened with, you know, the rise of hybrid, um, yeah, the hybrid meetings and people can participate just as well uh, online. So, um, and I do think these amendments make it kind of obviate a lot of the benefits of what this um, SB 544 originally tried to do. Thank you, Mr. Lay. I agree um, with you. Um, I have mentioned this before, um, but I think that it's time to mention it again and perhaps in a little bit more detail. I am disappointed in the legislature um, for amending the bill in this way, really disappointed in its lack of attention to accessibility for people with disabilities, for people with children, for people who have jobs and are not able to make a long trip to a board meeting um, in a reasonable way. I absolutely understand that there are benefits to meeting in person. I really value seeing my fellow board members in person, seeing staff in person, seeing members of the public who came today in person. There is a value there. There is also a value in having both the meetings for the public and for members of your commissions and boards as Californians to be drawn from the entire population of the state. That includes people with disabilities. That includes people like me who had to, and you know, it's ironic because this is the privacy board, but um, are the private, the board of the privacy agency. But you know what? One of the things I won't do is compromise other people's privacy. So I'll talk about my own situation. I have a connective tissue disorder. It is physically very difficult for me to get to these meetings. Currently, um, it is very painful for me to ride in a car. Now, if I had not already joined the board, I'm and I had to do this on a regular basis, if I had to fly to LA, for example, this may be something that I would not reasonably be able to do. And I am only one example. There are people who have lots to give to the state of California for whom this requirement makes the possibility to serve or the possibility of participating as a member of the public um, either impossible or unreasonable. Our state is 60, or sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm giving us more of a population we have. Our state is 40 million people spread over a vast area. People in the far north of the state, in the far east of the state, in the Central Valley, in the far south of the state, in rural areas and urban areas and small towns throughout this entire state should be able to serve and they should be able to participate fully as members of the public. Um, I am really grateful to everyone who is here in person. I'm also grateful to the 200 and some people who are here on Zoom. We are delighted to have you. I look forward to hearing any comments that you have. I won't be able to see you. On Zoom, I would be able to see you. And yes, it's not quite the same as in person, but it is a more complete experience for all of us um, than uh, this difficult hybrid situation. So I just do not see how the benefit of having um, some forced meetings in person uh, to the level that the logistics become impossible again outweighs the benefit of having the service on boards and commissions and public meetings to be truly accessible to the people of California. Um, and therefore, I really appreciate Ms. Mahoney and staff keeping track of this for us. Um, you know, I, sorry for speaking personally about my own situation. I just don't know, I don't wanna speak about other people's situations. And I think it's really important for the legislature to understand what they're doing here. Um, so I'm happy to offer myself up for that purpose. Um, uh, and I just would like everybody to understand 
that as I do that, I am standing in for probably millions of people. Um, and that this is a problem that we can solve. It is a problem that should be solved. As Mr. Lay said, Badly Keen was passed a long time ago. It was solving a problem. It's absolutely you know, impeccable in its values and the goals that it's trying to achieve, and it needs to achieve them. So thank you for hearing me out. <laughs> um, if there are other comments or questions, uh, obviously I, um, I support the recommendation. Ms. De La Torre or Mr. Lay? I, um, I do have a few questions. And first of all, let me start to just appreciate, I, I was more aware than the public of the challenges that our chair faces, but thank you for being here today with us. Uh, your presence is valuable and your leadership is valuable to the board. Um, I, I do, I'm a little behind behind on this bill because we didn't receive the information yeah. until yesterday. And so, so just bear with me in terms of helping me understand. So if this was enacted if as, as it is next year, we could still have a Zoom in our meetings to enable the 255 people that are today with us to still be present with us. Right? Like that would not necessarily go away. We still could add a Zoom. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And then we could have our six meetings next year. And if our chair was in a situation where, you know, it would be better for her not to um, not to come in person, so long as in this case, like Mr. Lee and myself were here, she could we could hold this same meeting with her having the advantage of being at, at her house, is that? No, but if Mr. McTaggart were here, I think we could try to do, it just, it would not be logistically really feasible, but you have to have a quorum of the board, which is three people. So we ourselves are a quorum. Okay, so if three members were here, then the other two members could be remote. Is that how it will work? I believe so, yeah. That would be the requirement that there would have to be a uh, majority or quorum of board members in a physical location in at least 50% of the meetings, although that would raise the question of how you would determine um, how you get to that 50%. Would you need to have additional meetings, um, so on and so forth? But if we schedule our six meetings to be in person, I mean, I think it will be really rare that I mean, so yeah, sorry, I, I'm a little confused again. So we have six meetings that we expect to have every year. But we could have, for example, an emergency meeting. That emergency meeting will also have to be same same rules: three people here at the minimum, and, and two people possibly remote. Or could one of them be fully remote? Um, I mean, that would. I think that would depend on the on the circumstances. It would depend on how many total meetings you ended up having in the year. Odd number is a different thing than even number. So I, what I'm starting to kind of understand here is, wouldn't we be better off next year if this is enacted versus if it is not enacted? Because what is the alternative B that we stay where we are right now? And we have to force our chair to come to every meeting in person next year. Or is there a, a different bill that we can support? I, I'm just kind of trying to understand. Um, I think the issue is that the language of the bill is still in flux, and there are a number of discussions going on among stakeholders. And staff felt that we couldn't give a support recommendation to the bill in its current form, that we would like to see changes to that language um, to you know, better ensure accessibility of these meetings. And that's why we recommended a support if amended position. Um, so that there, if there are amendments to um, make it more consistent um, with the original goals of the bill, then staff would feel comfortable recommending support. So I would say we could certainly have a discussion about what the threshold might be. I'm I, Again, I'm disappointed in the legislature because I don't understand why they're nickel and diming this. Um, and they're creating a situation where they're dialing back true accessibility 
and having it be this like pained, difficult situation that is costly as well for agencies to try to set up these hybrid situations um, in order for everyone to participate. Um, if it's better that everybody's in person, um, then, um, you know, it needs, why then are we going to like do this? I feel like the, the legislature is, is kind of acknowledging that there's an accessibility problem, but is not acknowledging that um, in, in a way that they actually create a reasonable um, choice, a reasonable accommodation. I mean, you know, yes, Ms. De La Torre, we could try to have a meeting where some board members are here and some board members are not. Logistically, like that's just really difficult. And I don't think there's any reason for it to be so difficult. Um, you know, I just don't see the benefit of forcing this sort of difficulty on the state and forcing this difficulty on people who have various reasons why it's difficult for them to come to Oakland or LA or whatever um, every time for a board meeting. Yeah. Mr. Sultani? I, I am very supportive of um, our chairperson. And to be honest, in, in this vote, I think that I will vote with whatever she votes because that's the person that I you know, personally want to support. But I'm also concerned about a dynamic that can get us in a position where we could have something that's better next year and we don't and we don't have it. And so I I do understand. Yeah. But I want to create flexibility mm -hmm. for our staff to to negotiate this support because ultimately, you know, we went through the process with um C CPA and CPRA of thinking, you know, what language should be in this proposal so that we can um, have the support that was necessary to enact it. And, and those processes sometimes don't lead you to the perfect deal that you will hope to have, but it, 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 it's an incremental improvement. So if, if there's a possibility that we can support an incremental improvement and in the assessment of the staff, that is better than not, not having anything basically, I just want them to have the ability within whatever we um, guidance we provide to to kind of yes. maneuver that. Yes, I so I agree with you. Um, I think that my personal view is that I agree with staff that as currently amended, I just don't think this is worth the game is not worth the candle. Um, we could certainly talk about some ideas for what might be better. Um, and um, we can do a motion that is similar to the last motion, which would be that we support staff's recommendation with regards to the current iteration of the bill. Um, and we authorize staff in their discretion to support um, if it's amended in a way um, that in staff's discretion would meet with the values or the requirements that we talk about here today that they've laid out in their memo. And we had also authorized them to then withdraw support if it gets amended again, you know, so that they would need to oppose it. So we can certainly do that. And we can offer some thoughts about, you know, what we think might be reasonable. Um, I, I have a question for council. In this situation, I, I strongly feel that um, our chair should be the voice of the board on this. Will there be a possibility for um, us to just delegate on her and empower her to, you know, direct the staff as needed until the end of this process and let her be the, the voice of the board on this issue so that she, she, she has that um, opportunity to um, be part of that conversation if, if, if that's something that you would I, be I would, open to. Yeah, that because I will be very open to just, just directly empower our chair to, to be the voice of the board on this not only now, but just moving forward for whatever other amendments might come next year. Mr. Lay, uh, yeah, I, I would, I would, I would be, uh, I would support that. And I'll just, I'll just say, you know, a support of amendment, if amended, is not an, in a, not an opposed, right? Mm -hmm. It, it, the bill could still pass, you know, as is. You know, we would, we just saying we wish it was better, right? So it's not necessarily a binary like if we do a support of amend, then we get nothing, right? Is this bill could very much still pass. Uh, even if we we as an agency say we we want it amended, what what we do do is add to the voices saying you know the original language was better. Um, this should go back to you know what was originally discussed. 
Um, so I, I, I don't think it's quite as binary as we don't have it. It's back to the status quo if we vote this way. But that said, I, I, I you know, I like the idea. Um, you know, I would be happy to defer to the chair um, on this this issue on you know how to approach these our position on um, this bill as it evolves. Okay. Well, I, I'm just thinking that um, there's dynamics that could be. We only meet six times uh, <laughs> a year, right? And 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 things might change, and and so. Um, I, I feel very represented by the voice of the chair on this on this topic, and we'll be very happy to fully delegate on her um, being uh, representing the board on this. Um, so, first of all, Mr. Laird, is that that is something that could be delegated? Yeah, in fact, but, you know, pretty explicitly in the law. That yeah. Can be delegated okay. Chairperson. Um, I you know I appreciate that. I do want to be clear that I use myself as an example, but I don't want to suggest that I can possibly speak for the wide range of experiences um, I was hoping to invoke in general. Um, so I want to be clear about that, and I would hope that we could also be sure that um, the board supports the staff's analysis of the resources it would take for the agency um, to. Um, fulfill the requirements in any sort of version of the bill, et cetera. Um, I'd also just like to highlight um, and reiterate what Mr. Lay said about support. Um, support, if amended, um, is different from, from oppose. I mean, I think it could get to a point that has down that path, could get to a point where maybe staff should be authorized to oppose it. But, um, but that seems the right, that really seems the right message to me to send. So up, up to the chair, if you would prefer to vote on, on it as we were um, planning, or if if you will, I know that you have many other obligations, but if you are willing to be the voice of the board and, and you would prefer to just uh, having us delegate that directly on you for this year and other years moving forward, I'm open to both possibilities. Uh, thank you, Ms. De La Troy. I'm not sure logistically it's much different. Um, but um, I guess I would ask what Mr. Lay would prefer, and let's just go with that. Uh, with with the, between. Yeah, I, I think you know, I, uh, perhaps you you had mentioned some a middle ground where um, you know allowing staff and I guess you mm -hmm. to to change our position as the political as we get a better understanding of how this bill is developing, support for it is developing. So you may want to change the position if the amendments change. Um, so, you know, I, I would be fine with that middle ground. I think I would vote for support if, uh, support if amended now with the caveat that um, you would work with staff to, um, you know, change our position as, as needed. We delegate to you and staff. All right. Mr. Where does that work? We could also do two motions, one which is um, similar to the one that we have on the table for the other bills, but amended for the position here. And one that just, I guess, delegated to the chair the ability to speak on this bill if the opportunity arises or something like Maybe that. Maybe speak on behalf of the board in between board meetings. So if there's mm -hmm. any conversation that needs to be had on this in between board meetings, the the, uh, the um, voice of the chair is the voice of the board. I think any of those options are perfectly valid under the law. Um, it really is just which which sort of flavor you all would like to choose um, of those options. Um, but, you know, to the points made today, I'll just emphasize, and I'm sure Maureen would say the same thing, that, uh, you know, staff can absolutely work in consultation with the chair on this, regardless of sort of the form of the motion today. But Okay. Um, and well, after that little speech, I might get called to the legislature. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, all right. So um, in that case, let me let me see if I can put this together. Let's start with the just position on the bill. Um, may I have a motion to authorize agency staff to, as um, suggested, support SB 544, if amended, to remove the proposed requirement that a majority of members of the state body be president at one physical location for a minimum of 50% of the meetings of the state body each year or if it is otherwise amended in such a way that in staff's discretion is consistent with the objectives laid out in the staff analysis and discussed by the board today 
to authorize staff to um, support the bill if amended in that way, and to authorize staff to remove support or oppose if other amendments and staff's discretion render the bill sufficiently inconsistent with the objectives laid out by staff analysis and the board's discussion today. So I think that would be one. I don't think I can keep going. Um, I think we would need to stick it, keep it to that, and then talk about the other thing. Um, so does that, did, did that make sense? May I have that motion? Yeah. No. I move. Thank you, Ms. Delatory. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, and then may I also have a motion to delegate to the chair of the board um, the ability to speak for the board and the agency um, and offer its position on SB 544 in its current form or as amended? I move. I second. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Laird, I want to check. Okay, thumbs up from Mr. Laird. Um, we have properly formulated motions. Um, and just as a reminder to everyone on the public, um, we also have a motion on the table um, to uh, take staff's recommendation on the suite of other bills um, that were brought before the board today. Um, and those motions are both on the table. Um, so with that, I'd like to ask for public comments in case anybody has um, comments that they would like um, to provide to us before we vote. Okay, so this is for agenda item four. If you'd like to make a comment on this item, please raise your hand at this time using Zoom's raised hand feature or by pressing star nine if you're joining us by phone today. And this is for agenda item four, legislative update and authorizing CPPA's position on pending legislation. Again, if you'd like to speak at this time, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine. This is the final call for agenda item for public comment. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Um, in that case, um, uh, I would uh, ask you to please call the roll call vote for the motion on AB 947, AB 1194, AB 1546, and SB 362 that we formulated earlier in our discussion. Okay, this is a roll call for the motion as stated by the chair, uh, board member De La Torre. Uh, aye. De La Torre, aye. Board member Lay. Aye. Lay, aye. Board member McTaggart. Chair Urban. Aye. Urban, aye. Madam Chair, you have three ayes and um, one no voting. Thank you very much. The motion carries by a vote of three to zero. Um, but um, with that, so we have authorized staff action uh, on the AB 947, 1194, 1546, and SB 362 is discussed. Um, now let's address SB 544. And I do apologize. I was trying to be efficient. I didn't restate the motion. Would you like me to restate? No, no. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> Mr. Um, Mr. Sabo, um, could you please conduct the roll call vote um, on the board's motion related to SB 544 from earlier in our discussion? Yes. Board Member De La Torre? Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board Member Lay? Aye. Lay, aye. Board Member McTaggart? Chair Urban? Aye. Urban, aye. Madam Chair, you have three ayes. Oh, dear. You know what? I did not. We had two motions. Um, we got to do that again. Uh, I think it I think it'd be fine if we, um, I, to me, it was significantly or uh, was clear. sufficiently clear that that was for the first motion. So yeah. I think we'll do one more vote for the okay. final motion. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Laird. And my apologies for the glitch. I can glitch, too. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Mr. Sabo, could you please call the roll call vote on the second motion we formulated with regards to SB 544, which relates to um, uh, delegating to the chair the ability to speak on the bill? Yes. Board Member De La Torre? Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board Member Lay? Aye. Lay, aye. Board Member McTaggart? Chair Urban? Aye. Urban, aye. Madam Chair, you have three ayes. Thank you very much. So both of those motions carry with a vote of three to zero. Um, thank you very much to um, board members for the thoughtful discussion, to Ms. Mahoney for the really helpful guidance um, walking us through this. Um, and we will look forward to talking about um, a somewhat larger landscape um, in the future, um, understanding that we respect your discretion and helping us figure out what is a 
a good sort of path there. Um, with that, um, it is 1136. So um, I think we are in good time um, for our schedule. Um, so let's move along to agenda item number five, which is an update on the Ch California Children's Data Protection Working Group, which will also be presented by Deputy Director Mahoney. Um, Ms. Mahoney, please go ahead. Thank you, Chairperson and members of the board. The California Age Appropriate Design Code, which went into effect January 1st, 2023, among other provisions, creates the California Children's Data Protection Working Group, which is tasked with submitting a biennial report to the legislature uh, that makes recommendation until 20, 2030 that makes recommendations on best practices regarding children's access to online services, products, and features. Appointments to that working group were previously delayed uh, because the age appropriate design code did not clarify in which state agency the working group would be housed, raising questions as to funding and staffing of that working group. A budget related bill, AB 127, uh, was signed earlier this week by Governor uh, Newsom, and that helped clarify some of these questions. The bill houses the working group operations within the office of the attorney general. It also pushed back the due date of the first report from January 1st, 2024 to July 1st, 2024, and then every two years thereafter until 2030. The bill removed one of the agency's appointments to the working group. So the group will consist of nine members. We understand this revision was made to further minimize the impact um, to the agency. With respect to the agency's appointment to the working group, staff are still in the vetting process. We expect to have a candidate for the board to consider at the September board meeting. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Mahoney. So the rulemaking authority and enforcement authority are still with the attorney general's office, correct? And correct. that didn't change. So that, okay, so the legislature basically rationalized the situation. Correct. Okay. Um, the attorney general, as you said, has rulemaking and enforcement authority with respect to the age appropriate design code. Um, so consistent with that, the working group um, is going to be housed with the attorney general. So. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, comments, questions, Ms. De La Torre, Mr. Lake? Uh, no. Okay, I, I just have a question. Um, was it offered to the agency the possibility of housing the working group within the agency? There seems to be a lot of alignment between that law and, and what we pursue. Was that offered to us? There were discussions um, about where to house the working group. Um, you know, one option was within the agency. However, there were a number of concerns um, as to the impact of housing the working group. Uh, with the agency, uh, given that our focus needs to be on meeting the responsibilities um, directed to us by Proposition 24, specifically to complete these rulemakings, um, there were concerns that um, it could divert resources from our, our key priorities. Concerns raised by, by other stakeholders? Um, you know, lar largely within, within staff are concerns. So we were offered the opportunity to house the working group, but we we decided that that might not be um, beneficial. Is that? Well, staff pointed out concerns as to um, how housing the working group within the agency could uh, impact our operations, as well as the consistency with housing uh, the working group with the Office of the Attorney General, which also has rulemaking and enforcement authority over the age appropriate design code. Is there a connectivity between that and the fact that we lost one appointee or that's not related? Um, that's unclear to me. I don't have a window into that decision-making process. Okay. I suppose. I, Mr. Light? Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, considering they have rulemaking and enforcement authority, I think it, it did make most sense for it to be in DOJ personally. Um, I appreciate that you all shared, you know, as, as a growing agency, this may take a lot of resources to house uh, a nine-person working group. I was, I'm curious, 
does that would that working group have to also do Bagley Keen meetings? Um, okay. No. Yes, the the working group um, uh, would have to follow Bagley Keen. However, there was a provision um, that was added through that budget related bill AB one twenty seven. Um, stating that um, the meetings could be held by teleconference, but you know it was a bit vague as to how that would interact with Bagley Keen. Interesting. Okay. Further comments or questions? No. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there comments or questions from the public? Comments, excuse me. This is for agenda item five the California Children's Data Protection Working Group update. If you'd like to make a comment on this agenda item at this time, please raise your hand using Zoom's raised hand feature or by pressing star nine if you're joining us by phone. Again, this is for agenda item five, the California Children's Data Protection Working Group update. This is the final call for public comment on agenda item five. If you'd like to make a comment. Oh, I see Lisa Gavin. I'm going to uh, unmute you at this time and you'll have uh, three minutes to make your public comment. Lisa, go ahead whenever you're ready. Hi, Lisa, can you hear us? So Lisa's hand is raised, but she is not responding. Lisa, you've been unmuted, so you can go ahead and begin your public comment. Okay, Lisa has lowered their hand, if there are no other public comments. If anyone else would like to speak at this time, please go ahead and raise your hand or press star nine if you're joining by phone. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any other hands. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Sabo. Uh, with that, it is 11.45. Um, and the next item on our agenda is a, a new CPRA rule subcommittee update. And based on the materials, I think that we will have um, a robust presentation and discussion. Um, so I um, propose that we go ahead and plan to break for lunch for everybody, uh, public and everybody, and for the board um, to, to take out of order our closed session uh, agenda item so that we can most efficiently use everyone's time. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the meeting, um, the, uh, we have a closed session item for, which is listed as agenda item number 14. I'm going to take this out of order. Um, while everyone breaks for lunch, the board will go into closed session to meet to discuss that item. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the item. Um, and uh, find out if there is public comment that we should hear before we go into closed session. Um, so pursuant to government code section 11126E1 and 2A, the board is going to meet in closed session to confer and receive advice from legal counsel regarding the following matter. California Chamber of Commerce versus California Privacy Protection Agency et al in Superior Court of the State of California and the County of Sacramento, case number 34-2023-8000416. CUWMGDS. Um, so that's what we will be discussing in closed session. Before we depart, is there any public comment from uh, uh, from members of the public? Yes, sorry. Chair Urban, I would just say that uh, public comment is actually not required for this closed session item in oh, okay. advance, but if the board is interested interested in so taking it. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I I think it I think it would be good to hear if people have any comments before we have the discussion. 
Um, so if, if, if those exist, um, please let us know. Raise your hand via Zoom or come to the podium. So this is for the closed session item. If you'd like to make a public comment at this time, please raise your hand or press star nine on Zoom or on your phone rather, I apologize. This is for uh, the closed session item. If you'd like to speak at this time, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands raised at this time. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. All right, for everyone, um, the board will uh, repair um, to the closed session location to have that discussion. We will keep the public meeting um, on Zoom open. Um, everyone who's here in person, of course, you're welcome to um, go get lunch, um, take a break. I cannot predict exactly how long the discussion will require, but so what I'm going to do is say that we won't come back before a certain time so that everyone can feel confident that they won't miss anything if they're back by that time. Um, uh, shall we say an hour? Shall we say 1 p.m.? 1 p.m.? All right. We won't come back before 1 p.m., um, we may return after that time if necessary, but we won't start before then. Um, so everyone should know um, that you can take a break for at least that time. Thanks very much to everyone for everything we've discussed this morning. Um, and we will see you um, later on today. We are now in recess. Oh, shoot. We're not in recess. I'm sorry. We're going into closed session. My apologies, everybody. Are we ready to begin? Yeah. Wonderful. Welcome back um, everyone to the CPPA board meeting um, for July 14th, 2023. Uh, we will be turning to agenda item number six, which is an update from the new CPRA rules subcommittee. I'd like to ask you to please turn your attention to the materials for this agenda item. As a reminder, the new CPRA rules subcommittee or new rules or new rules subcommittee for short is composed of Mr. Lay and Ms. De La Torre. It was informed to advise the board on some new rulemaking set out in the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020, the voter initiative, and its complementary subcommittee was the update CCPA subcommittee, which advised on rulemaking topics that integrated with the rules already promulgated by the Attorney General in 2020. That subcommittee has finished its work as the rules package was adopted and approved earlier this year. Um, before I turn things over, I just wanted to say a couple of things. First, I really want to thank the new rules subcommittee and terrific staff, um, attorneys for the tremendous amount of work so far on this really interesting and complex area including the um, preliminary request for comment that we've received uh, comments um, in response to already. And I'd like to thank the public for its continued robust participation in our rulemaking um, with the preliminary request for comment. Again, we got um, a, a lot of comments and a lot of really thoughtful 
um, and substantive comments. I just want to thank the public for that and for its um, uh, uh, for its attention to these important topics. Second, I will take the opportunity to um, recommend again um, how the public can keep up with our rulemaking work. Uh, the website cppa.ca.gov is a great, great place to start. If you click on the regulations page, you'll find the staff has prepared an FAQ and regularly publishes relevant materials, including the public comments that I just mentioned. And you can check that out at cppa.ca.gov uh, slash regulations, or just click on regulations from the homepage. And you can sign up for our rulemaking email list in order to receive rulemaking notices directly. And for that, go to cp cppa.ca.gov and click on join our mailing list on the front page. Um, I'd also like to welcome staff attorneys Kristen Anderson and Neela Fersheik, um, who are joining us for this discussion today. Thanks again to Mr. Lay and Ms. De La Torre. Please take it away. Oh, thank you, Board Member, or Chair Urban. Um, do we have the slides? And we'll probably need to Turn it on. open that up too. All right, so I'll begin. Um, so as we previewed in our last board meeting, the new rules subcommittee and staff have identified key issues related to cybersecurity audits, risk assessments, and automated decision-making technology for future board discussion. So this presentation provides a status update to the board and tees up these issues for board discussion at a subsequent meeting. Um, but first, on behalf of the subcommittee, uh, I wanted to give um, a huge thanks to Neela Fersheik and Kristen Anderson for the tremendous work they put into both this presentation and the preliminary language that we are discussing today. Um, so next slide, yes. Um, no, for this rulemaking package, the agency has engaged in several pre-rulemaking activities um, on the topics uh, just discussed. We are currently reviewing the public's comments and drafting regulatory texts. Um, once again, I'll note, you know, the staff has made tremendous progress, and this is a, a way for us to preview key issues for further board discussion. Um, this will help inform staff in the subcommittee if we have a general board concession, consensus on the approach we have taken, uh, and whether we need to add or subtract anything as we approach the official rulemaking process. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we are on the overview of key issues. So uh, as, a, as a reminder, the CCPA directs the agency to issue regulations on these three topics, cybersecurity audits, risk assessments, and automated decision-making technology. Um, the purpose of a cybersecurity audit is generally to help businesses assess and improve their practices in protecting personal information. The purpose of a risk assessment is generally to help businesses assess and mitigate privacy risks before engaging in certain activities. And the purpose of access rights and opt-out rights regarding automated decision-making technology is to provide consumers with meaningful information and the ability to control how businesses use that personal information, um, including providing consumers with the ability to opt out. So for each of these topics, um, there are several questions that need to be answered in the regulations, and we've listed some of those questions here on this slide. And... Um, this, this presentation will preview some of the language to the board and the public. Uh, we've developed and specific issues that we recommend the board discuss both today and at a future board meeting. Um, these issues are bolded on the slide. Um, the regulations will address all of the questions above, but the feedback on these key issues in bold is necessary to inform our future drafting. Um, you know, and these are bolded because of their complexity and impact and we wanted to give board members the ability to consider them further um, as we proceed in drafting. Um, and then I will hand it off to Ms. De La Torre uh, to talk about the cybersecurity audits. Thank you. I also wanna take the time to thank the staff for the wonderful work that they have done supporting um, this subcommittee. We're gonna move on to uh, cybersecurity audits and um, maybe go to the, this, this is not, thank you. Um, this is simply a reminder of the rulemaking authority that was granted by statute on this agency. Um, we um, have authority to issue regulations on cybersecurity audits under 1798 
1A15A of our statute. Um, we can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. As background on the work that has been done on cybersecurity audits, our staff has looked into uh, examples of frameworks and resources um, that are available and comparable to what we um, intend to do. So for example, the California OAG and the FTC data security orders and guidance have been reviewed by staff and are uh, considered in terms of our drafting, the CIS critical security controls, the NIST cybersecurity framework, NIST special publication 853, New York DF uh, cybersecurity regulations, GLBA safeguards rule, FFIEC Council's audit IT examination handbook and California insurance code. This is not an exhaustive list. There's many other resources that um, have been considered. And we just are you know, sharing some of them to give you a flavor of the work that has been done and the kind of um, frameworks and resources that we have consulted. Um, most privacy and data protection laws do not have a specific requirement for cybersecurity audits, however. So we are a little unique in California in terms of our uh, regulatory mandate. If we can move to the next slide, please. One of the key questions that we are bringing to the board for consideration when it comes to cybersecurity audits is what should be the threshold uh, of applicability of the requirement. And that in a nutshell means which organizations will um, be required to comply with the obligation to undergo cybersecurity audits. Um, the language that we have here aligns with what at this point um, the subcommittee would like to recommend to the board we bring it for discussion and welcome um, comments from other board members. Um, the way we have been looking at this after um, a lot of consideration is that um, we think that business that primarily of significantly engage in sale and sharing of personal information should be subject to the cybersecurity audit requirement regardless of the size of the business, meaning if they are within the threshold of our law, which, you know, there's three different um, categories um, and, the, and the business is um, either a data broker um, or a business that engages primarily in sharing personal information as defined in our law, um, and the subcommittee um, recommendation will be to uh, impose on um, those organizations the obligation to um, conduct cybersecurity audits. Beyond that group, beyond the group of data brokers, we do think that there is uh, wisdom in uh, calibrating this obligation based on the size of the business. We are envisioning these cybersecurity audits not as a mere uh, check the box exercise, but as an in-depth look into the actual cybersecurity status of the organization. And that obviously comes with a cost. We want to be mindful of not affecting smaller organizations, medium organizations that perhaps need um, resources and education on how to improve their cybersecurity posture, but might not have the resources to engage in the kind of um, um, work that we expect from cybersecurity audits. So then the... Um, uh, policy question becomes what will constitute a large business. Um, this is something that is actively being discussed within the subcommittee. Um, we have an example here of how we could go around defining large business. It's very preliminary. It might be that we go in a different direction, uh, but we wanted to bring it for discussion and we welcome um, the feedback of um, other board members, which in this case is <laughs> Chairman <laughs> Irvin. Um, the one thing that I wanted to highlight is that we envision this discussion as an ongoing discussion, meaning um, we will have another uh, opportunity to have this conversation in the next uh, meeting of the board. So it's not necessary for you know, um, 
the other board members to necessarily provide all of their feedback right now, but to the extent that they have um, any um, opinion that they want to share with us, we, we welcome that. So the example that we have here will be uh, going around defining with a large business based on um, the amount of um, data that they process annually, um, the amount of sensitive personal information that they process annually. Uh, it could also um, be correlated to the annually process, the personal information of minors, which is another area uh, for me of particular concern. And I think uh, for the subcommittee, protecting minors. Um, there are other ways of defining what's a large business. There's um, um, statutes that define large business around the um, number of employees uh, that an organization has. It could be a threshold that relates to um, the um, revenue of the organization. This is an active conversation, so please don't think that this is you know, the final language that we are uh, suggesting. Uh, we want to pause here and give an opportunity to um, Chairman Irvin to share any thoughts that he might have on, first of all, the idea of if you're a data broker because you're benefiting from the data by selling it, we expect you to be more responsible with mm -hmm. the data and therefore you should be subject to the cybersecurity requirement even if you are smaller. And then the second piece of this will be However, if you're not in that category of data broker, we're going to consider the size of your business in terms of where we set the threshold for uh, applicability of the obligation. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I, first of all, I really appreciate how carefully this is thought out. Um, I apologize to everybody in the room and on camera that I'm now turning this way um, so that I can see uh, Ms. Taylor and Mr. Lay. Um, so I, I think this is quite well thought out. I had a, a couple of observations. Um, first of all, I really appreciate that the subcommittee um, with staff have um, included both of the considerations you mentioned, Ms. De La Torre. So there is a question, of course, of resources um, for a business to have to expend, and when is that reasonable? Um, so maybe that is tied to the amount of resources available to the business and the sort of scope of their business. Um, but I think it's really important that you also um, connected the responsibility to how involved they are with consumers' personal information. Um, and under the definition of large business, um, there is the possibility, again, of calibrating it back to the information, to how much information they have, to how much sensitive personal information they have. I think that's just a crucial way to think about it. I'm quite sensitive to the concerns of smaller entities, um, but unfortunately, we know that there is great cybersecurity risk um, from entities who don't secure their data properly, no matter what their size. And we know that there are attacks on small entities specifically, precisely because there's a hope that, you know, their cybersecurity defenses aren't as robust. So I think that it's important for us to provide guidance to business and protection for consumers that takes into account both of those things. Um, with regards to the um, thresholds that um, are offered on the slide, and also later down, there's some more specific thresholds on different things. Um, you know, for me, it's also calibrated against what is the requirement. Um, so I absolutely agree that it shouldn't be a box checking exercise, um, but what's the sort of balance between the resources? Again, we're going to ask um, businesses to um, expend and the value received from that and sort of how far the obligation um, extends. So I think that you know, my initial thinking about this is that this looks like a pretty reasonable framework um, and, and quite thoughtful. And then it's also going to be affected by what that actual the cybersecurity audit requirements look like, because that's going to hit different businesses differently. Um, the second um, sort of, that was sort of a set of observations just about the structure. Um, the second observation I had, um, which you alluded to, Ms. De La Torre, is that if I'm understanding this correctly, this is a nested set of thresholds that exist within the existing thresholds in the statute. Um, and so I don't have a very fully formed thought on this. So please, you know, take this with somewhat of a grain of salt. Um, but I think it would be important to think about 
um, the value of simplicity, given that we already have thresholds in the statute that take into account um, business resources and, and also how much personal information they handle, as, and then a new set of thresholds, right? So it's, I'm assuming that, you know, the civil committee thought about this and um, has decided that it would be valuable to have a second set of thresholds, but I think it would be useful to think through um, where that where that makes sense or where simplicity might be useful too, both for consumers and also for businesses. So that was just an observation that I really only had as I was looking at it this time. Um, and so forgive me for it being a little bit half-baked. Um, finally, I also appreciate, Ms. De La Torre, what you suggested with regards to process. I do think it'll be really important for us to um, talk when we have a little bit more detail um, so that we can judge you know, some of the trade-offs and sort of what's required in the cybersecurity audits, as I alluded to earlier. And when we have you know, Mr. McTaggart here, um, and hopefully our fifth board member, um, I'm hesitant, <laughs> you know, um, I'm hesitant to, um, for the three of us to make too many decisions, but I, you know, I think this is a good start. And I would just um, ask that as um, staff work on this, that some of the considerations that I mentioned um, would, would be taken into account. I'm assuming you were thinking of most of those, if not all of them. Right. I, I just wanted to um, share some thoughts that might be part of the conversation. I agree that we do not need to um, come to a conclusion. It was not meant to um, be, um, a, you know, and it's meant to be an ongoing conversation. But in terms of the thresholds, there's that correlation, and you alluded to this, to what, what's the cost of conducting a mm -hmm. cybersecurity audit and because we envision this cybersecurity audits as an in-depth cybersecurity audit we do not expect them to be um you know as affordable as a more of a tick the box exercise and then um the idea of not having thresholds which is i think where you alluded just you know um to potentially have all businesses that are subject to CCPA is subject to this cybersecurity requirement. Um, our concern is that potentially uh, businesses that not they cannot necessarily um, easily afford a cybersecurity audit cost might be subject to it. Um, it also, the idea of you're taking resources from maybe you know hiring uh, somebody else or whatever purposes you have in terms of uh, of growth. So this is an ongoing conversation within within the subcommittee and we hope to come to you with more concrete references mm -hmm. on how to balance that. Yeah. But um, that's why we steer away from saying we shouldn't have any um, thresholds. We should just apply this across the board to all of the organizations that are subject to CCPA. I hope that that yeah. you know, was, was kind of a helpful reference uh, for... Um, uh, Chair Irvin. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'd just like to add to that. Yeah, I think there, there we had a lot of stuff in the discussion about how do we balance this. Um, we don't have the cybersecurity audit requirements um, on these slides. I mm -hmm. think we we have fleshed them out uh, to some extent. Um, hopefully, I don't know if it'll be possible to get it ready before the next board meeting or if we could release that um, just to make a fuller discussion. But you know, I, I would hope so. Um, and then maybe you'll be able to see kind mm -hmm. of the, the trade-offs because, you know, there is trade-offs in terms of, yeah, if, if you do kind of just a basic one versus a, you know, thorough and independent mm -hmm. third-party audit. Um, so, yeah, like we're, we're kind of handicapping the conversation a little bit. Um, so I, I will acknowledge that. Um, but, yeah, I'll just say to, to the extent that we can, we'll try to get out those um, cybersecurity audit requirements. Okay. And so we, then... Um, what I was hoping to do was be helpful, um, and I, I hope, let me know if this is helpful, <laughs> um, which is that, um, again, I think that the considerations that you have embedded into these potential thresholds um, are the right considerations. They are the risk to the public, and they are what is reasonable. Um, and so I think that is, um, that makes sense. Um, and I'm glad to know that you're thinking about the sort of interaction between the different thresholds, the thresholds in the statute and the thresholds here, um, and that you are thinking of having the cybersecurity audits be 
um, you know, genuinely informative um, and thinking about sort of what that means for all of the affected parties. That's, that's the public and that's also um, businesses. Um, so I will look forward to a little bit more detail, but this seems like, to me as one board member, this seems like a reasonable way to think about it. Um, I hope that's helpful. That, that's very helpful. I'm going to try to summarize it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea of definitely for businesses that are data brokers mm. to not have thresholds, if they are subject to see CPA as a data broker, we expect them to just have a, a, a more um, robust cybersecurity program. Oh, that that would be you know one piece of it. And then for those businesses that are not data brokers, to continue considering whether not thinking about um, excluding some of those business could be um, not the right approach. So for data brokers, you have to commit to the cybersecurity audit, no matter what your size is, if you meet the uh, uh, baseline requirements for applicability of CCPA, for non-data brokers, continue to consider whether there should be a higher threshold. Is that is that uh, the summary of? Uh, yes. I mean, again, I think I will need to see more detail. I just, right. you know, I kind of endorse the way of thinking. Right. Um, and the slide says, uh, e.g. data brokers. I wouldn't want to tie us to a definition that oh, can, sure. yeah, yes. um, for, for data brokers. Um, uh, but, you know, that's, it does seem like a reasonable way to be thinking about it. And I will look forward to the, to the further detail whenever, whenever that's ready. Thank you so much. Mm. That was very helpful. Um, we're going to move on to the um, last slide on this cybersecurity piece which talks a little bit about how um, we are thinking um, to build these regulations so that we can ensure that this audit is uh, thorough and is independent. Um, the staff again has done, a, I think, a very um, great job at, at thinking about our options um, to ensure that those two things are um, implemented with this rule. So potential requirements to ensure uh, thoroughness that we are considering actively is number one, cybersecurity audits must articulate the scope and criteria and identify a specific evidence, um, the specific evidence that was examined. Um, number two, um, the regulations um, listing all of the components of a, of a cybersecurity program that cybersecurity audits must assess and document. And that doesn't mean that our regulations will be like, you know, guidance from NIST, but at least at the high level, mm -hmm. all of the requirements that we initially expect to see in a cybersecurity audit. Um, the last one, cybersecurity audits should assess and document all applicable components of the business's cybersecurity program. So we are not envisioning this cybersecurity um, audits as being styled to one specific product, mm -hmm. but to be broader so that they cover all of the organizations, uh, all of the organization. Those are the uh, requirements that we are thinking about actively in terms of ensuring that the audit is thorough. In terms of potential requirements to ensure that the audit is independent, um, we are envisioning including in the rules uh, mandate for businesses to provide um, the independent auditor, auditor with all the information that will be relevant to the audit. In addition, we're thinking about um, establishing that the independent auditor must determine the scope of the cybersecurity audit and the criteria the cybersecurity audit will evaluate. Um, that will create a objectivity in terms of what the scope of the audit is as opposed to leaving necessarily to the business the decision on what the cybersecurity mm -hmm. audit should cover. Uh, finally, um, we just wanted to highlight the cybersecurity audit requirements will take into account um, cybersecurity audits, assessments, or evaluations a business has completed for other purposes. This is something that we saw often in the comments from organizations mm -hmm. that already conduct cybersecurity audits. And our idea is that to the extent that those cybersecurity audits are compliant with our 
requirements. They should not have mm -hmm. to redo the work. Obviously, if they are only partially mm -hmm. compliant, we would expect them to go, you know, to use what they have done, but go above um, what they have already done to um, extend their cybersecurity audit so that they can meet all of our requirements. So let me pause here. This is just a description of how uh, staff uh, has uh, suggested that we think about thoroughness and independent. Um, the subcommittee supports these, and we just wanted to um, gather the thoughts of Chairman Urban in terms of those ideas. It's not an exclusive list. Again, this is um, some high um, highlighted areas that we are considering. Uh, Mr. Lay, did you? No. Nope. Okay. Um, oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so thank you. Again, I think this is reasonable. It's well thought out. Um, I also wanted to go back and just say that I very much appreciate the review of all of the existing requirements, um, because to the extent that we can comport with existing requirements, even if we need to go beyond them or be a little bit different, obviously that will be um, uh, easier for businesses to comply with and ultimately better um, for, for consumers. Um, uh, and I, I see a lot of this as having similar um, a similar impetus um, while maintaining independence and thoroughness. Uh, I have some questions that I think will probably be worked out in the future. Um, for example, what is an independent auditor? Um, you know, are there criteria for the independent auditor um, in order for them to be, you know, appropriately a decision maker for some of these questions? Um, but again, I think I'll look forward to seeing the, the detail when we get to that part of the conversation. Um, I, I would like to pause for a second. I think that those are really important questions. We have members of staff present here that have helped really draft these regulations. So mm -hmm. I want to ask them if it would be appropriate for us to give um, the uh, chair urban any um, potential answers to the questions, or it might be preferable to just wait until we have um, more information for the board. Mm -hmm. Um, can you hear me? You'll have to bring it forward. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think it would likely be more beneficial for you all to be able to see the draft regulations um, that lay out some of the criteria of independence within within the context of the draft regulation. Um, and I defer to our general counsel about the appropriate time uh, to share those, but that, that would be my view. Thank you so much. So we'll just wait. Yeah, it's, yeah. it will come. <laughs> Um, and once again, I mean, it seems clear that you all are thinking about this, which is the, which is the main main thing at this point. Thank you so much. That concludes the presentation on cybersecurity. Um, we should move on to risk assessments. So if you go to the next slide after this, um, yeah. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah. So you know, just again, this is the authority for uh, our agency to do risk assessments, um, and. I'll get into more detail on how we're actualizing that on the next slide. Um, okay, so this slide proposes potential risk assessment thresholds for board discussion. Um, you know, a key issue for the risk assessment is what activities pose a significant risk to consumers' privacy and thus triggers a risk assessment. And um, as context, when we say thresholds, we mean that these activities would require risk assessment under the CCPA to determine whether the risks of these activities outweigh the benefits and to ensure businesses implement appropriate safeguards to address those risks. Um, these thresholds are generally interoperable with other state laws, you know, such as Colorado uh, and or the GDPR. The first set of thresholds address selling or sharing personal information, processing sensitive information, processing children's information, and using automated decision-making technology for certain key decisions, such as access to credit or other critical services and opportunities. Um, you know, these are thresholds that we, as a subcommittee, felt very confident about. Um, and however, you know, there are additional um, set of thresholds um, in the second set. Um, these are another set of potential thresholds for board member discussion which address issues such as employee monitoring, public surveillance, and training AI systems. Um, these are areas where we've identified um, a privacy gap in the current California marketplace and where there is significant concern among consumers, regulators, as well as other stakeholders right now. Um, for example, many data protection authorities require risk assessment for employee monitoring or public surveillance. Um, and I'll note uh, that the appendix contains 
um, more detailed language on these potential thresholds for risk assessment. But um, both now and at a future board meeting, I'd like to get uh, Chair Urban's and eventually the whole board's thoughts on you know whether those first four uh, we, we we feel comfortable with and whether uh, we should add as well the other three uh, thresholds. Um, thank you. Um, I just have a, this is, a, this is just a question, um, because I'm curious with regards to, um, the exception for employers in the first one, um, is that, um, is that related to the way it works with the GDPR or another law? Uh, not necessarily. We were thinking about um, the recommended initial uh, thresholds um, in a way aligning us to what's already required by Colorado. Mm -hmm. As you well know, Colorado doesn't mm -hmm. regulate the um, data of employees. So we wanted to be mindful of the fact that there are, for compliance reasons, there's sensitive data of employees that um, uh, employers have to just process and that's you know fairly regulated already. And so we didn't want to necessarily trigger an obligation to do a risk assessment for something that is already um, kind of implemented and regulated. Mm -hmm. um, we don't mean that language to be a concrete expression of how the final regulation um, might look like. We just wanted to bring to the board the idea that for sensitive personal information, you know, Colorado, and I'm going to check with the staff in case I misspeak, but Colorado does require uh, potential risk, as, uh, no, risk assessments for organizations that process sensitive information. In our case, we might want to think about sensitive information, but within the context of employment, we might want to set some safe harbors so that mm -hmm. we don't, you know, it will be really repetitive and have Right, you already value. have to apply right. protections right. Well, to social right. security numbers. That, yeah. Right, exactly, social security mm -hmm. numbers or situations where the, um, uh, you know, the business, especially large business, might have to collect information around um, demographics, demographics mm -hmm. because they are required to do so by federal law. That, that's the kind of um, situation where we didn't see a lot of value in, you know, requiring businesses to do more paperwork necessarily mm -hmm. is already regulated. So let me pause and uh, allow our staff to um, give us a little bit of um, the roadmap here and correct me if I was wrong. That is a accurate summary of the thinking behind the exception. Um, and so again, an example to potentially make this a bit more concrete, employers may have to collect certain government identifiers for just simple I-9 authorization. Um, they may have to connect, collect financial information from employees to enable direct deposits. This type of information is subject to general reasonable cybersecurity requirements under CCPA already, so it would not be without protection under our own existing framework. Um, but as board member De La Torre pointed out, it's not necessarily um, a significant risk to consumers' privacy that would trigger a risk assessment, um, simply because it is routine processing that also just may be required under certain um, other existing uh, federal and state privacy, uh, federal and state employment laws. For a lot of them, there are separate laws that um, require protections for for the information. Okay, um, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just note, you know, it's it's thinking about capturing, you know, employee monitoring mm -hmm. that isn't required by law, right? Or um, yeah, there, there's a lot of practices of that increasing, and those are things that we are concerned about. Um, and aren't things that we are considering like adding to that limited employment purposes, mm -hmm. purposes exception. I see. Mm -hmm. And you have that recommended for, you have recommended for discussion, a subset um, of, of information, well, a subset of processing, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, that would be to monitor or surveil, basically. Yeah. Right. Okay. And I just wanted to point out that we don't envision these rules as our final rules mm -hmm. on uh, risk assessments. So when we're thinking about our recommendations, we're thinking about what we think should go in this initial package from this point of view of the subcommittee. 
uh, versus the ones that, uh, recommended for discussion. They might be something that we want to consider now and adopt now or consider now and delay the adoption to future updates of the rules if we, mm -hmm. you know, if the board sees that as appropriate. Um, but we just thought that those three areas uh, were good examples of situations where um, perhaps other states do not require privacy uh, impact assessments, but um, we might we want, might want to think about requiring them either in this package or in future packages. And uh, Mr. Lay offered a really good example, which is the monitoring of employees. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, uh, there are some developments that are concerning that we might want to think about um, addressing to offer protections to residents of California. Thank you. Um, well, on review of the slides um, in preparation for the meeting and then listening um, to the presentation again, like these seem quite reasonable um, to me and also um, to put California in the position of maintaining our leadership, um, privacy and protection of, of natural persons as our statute puts it. Um, so I would look forward to the further development, I think of everything that you have on the slide. I will need to think about it more. Um, one of the things that I you know, noted as I was going through the slides is it's always harder to think of the thing that isn't in here. Yeah. Um, uh, and you seem, I mean, this looks really thorough to me, um, but I would like some time to think about it. And maybe when we finish the conversation about um, the work the committee's done thus far, we can talk a little bit about process mm -hmm. um, and what you're thinking about that and, and how we might organize um, the next step as we were discussing with, you know, the more detailed information about some of these things. But, you know, I think this is very thoughtfully, again, very thoughtfully done. Thank you. Great. Thanks. I'm going to try to summarize just so that, um, you know, for our work as a subcommittee, what I think I'm hearing is that the recommended um, thresholds for implementation um, that really align to Colorado are generally supported, like to, to set that as our baseline in terms of where we will require data protection impact assessments. And then we will continue the conversation on, on the other potential areas where we might wanna require data protection, data privacy impact assessments, even though they might not be required in other states. Is that a good summary? It is a general? good summary. I would go a little bit further and say that I think the items under recommended for discussion are in my view, and of course, within the discretion of you and staff in terms of resources, but in my view, these are all worthy of development which isn't to say that ultimately they will be something that the board decides to put in the package, yeah. but I think they're very much worthy of development. Um, I think that they are picking up on some real holes in protection that we've had um, for a while um, that affect people every day. Um, I think that you know it may be that as they're developed further, we see that there are trade-offs that may, make us want to, to wait or, you know, maybe to not continue with all of these, but these seem to be, um, I would say low hanging fruit is what's occurring to me, but I don't want to make it seem as though they're not um, creative, and, you know, and that you haven't put a lot of thought into them because it's obvious, you know, that, that you have. Um, I, I, uh, so I, I just want to be sure that it's clear that I think that they're worth, in my view, they're worth continuing with, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I'll move on to the next slide. And, you know, these are the teeth to, you know, those thresholds, right? So once that threshold is hit, you know, what do you have to do? And this is, um, you know, these are the activities um, and what should be included in a risk assessment for those activities that present a significant risk to consumers' privacy. This is just a quick preview, you know, uh, what should be included, such as the risks and benefits and, you know, that assessment from a company of whether, you know, this processing, uh, you know, the benefits of this processing outweigh those risks. Um, and, you know, I, I won't repeat all of these. I think the um, these risk assessment requirements are kind of what we're seeing um, generally. Uh, but what one area that I did want to flag for board discussion is that very final point, right? Mm -hmm. Additional assessment requirements for automated decision-making technology. Um, I think one thing is I've noticed with risk assessments in my research, 
and you know, in the SEO community has thought about this as well, is um, a lot of inconsistency in mm -hmm. between risk assessments. One company may do it very carefully, another one may not. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to compare, you know, how approaches to risk uh, within certain industries or across industries within different sectors. So one thing I wanted to raise is, should we advise staff to incorporate elements of um, standard elements into these risk assessments and in incorporating elements, particularly from the NIST AI risk management framework? Um, you know, they require documentation of certain metrics and uh, something that I feel could be, should be included in um, automated decision-making technology risk assessments. So for example, documentation requiring uh, requiring documentation of you know the metrics an entity has developed to measure the performance of an AI system right companies may have different metrics that's okay but uh, actually making this a standard element of a risk assessment will help comparison for the agency in doing its audits and enforcement um, or you know for example you know what fairness metrics were used to examine system performance across subgroups you know, were they using statistical parity, error rate equality, percentage point differences, or other methods to examine their performance? And then, you know, from there, perhaps we can develop best practices. So this is a bit more prescriptive um, than, you know, uh, I, I've seen other risk assessment regulations in other, in other jurisdictions, but I feel like this is something that, you know, California, again, can lead on, you know, it's, it's building on the work of, um, you know, other agencies such as NIST, uh, and yeah, we'll help the agency compare risk assessments across different sectors and learn best practices. So um, just something, I don't know if you have any initial thoughts or we can discuss that, you know, at a further board meeting, but, um, you know, we can discuss any of these elements, but that's in particular something I feel strongly about. Thank you. And Ms. Delatory, did you want to add anything? No, I fully support okay. the comments on member Yes, I mean, and it sounds as though um, you've been looking at the literature on what makes risk assessments effective um, and when they're not effective. Um, and so I, I think I defer to the subcommittee. Um, uh, I'm somewhat familiar with that literature, um, but um, I'm not an expert in it. Um, I would recommend, if you haven't, you probably have already, um, reading um, Ken Bamberger and Deirdre Mulligan's work, um, Privacy on the Ground, um, which I think has a sort of richly detailed description of sort of how um, various policies, um, risk assessments are um, come in there, um, can be implemented by, by businesses. Um, and I don't know that I have a comment on any individual um, item here. Um, I would say that I also um, tend to think that concreteness will be helpful in order to achieve parity uh, of information that is received and, and information um, that companies need to keep track of. Um, so if you have to actually report on something, then you have to pay attention to it. And that by itself is already important. Um, so I, and I think achieving parity in that way is important for a few reasons. A big one is, as you, as you mentioned, um, the agency's ability to enforce, the agency's ability to make decisions um, about where enforcement priorities should be um, um, and how to enforce. Of course, the trade-off is that the more prescriptive and concrete you are, um, the, the less flexible. So um, it is possible that we could get some of these wrong. Um, and um, I tend to agree that um, previous um, previous um, risk assessment requirements have perhaps been a little bit too general, allowing for that lack of parity. Um, and so, it, you know, in general, um, I'm supportive of trying to be more concrete. I think it's valuable for businesses as well because then they know what to do. Um, but I just wanted to name some of those trade-offs um, as as you continue to as you continue to think about this. Um, and of course, you know, this ties into, again, to the thresholds, like how much we require is related to the thresholds. Um, similarly, um, automated decision-making technology, um, I know we're going to talk about that next, but thinking carefully about what in is encompassed within automated decision-making technology will be, will be important. I think uh, to borrow the words of our executive director, that is a very helpful steer um, for, for staff uh, as and the subcommittee, you know, as we think through how to flesh out those automated decision-making technology risk assessment requirements. 
Um, so uh, I'll just quickly kind of talk about, um, give the next slide. I'll just quickly talk about, you know, other jurisdiction requirements. Um, we just want to briefly explain how other jurisdictions and other states of the EU have approached their analogous, analogous risk assessment requirements. Uh, these are often referred to as data protection assessments or impact assessments. Um, in other states, thresholds are generally laid out in state statutes. Colorado has also provided for additional requirements, risk assessments via the regulations. Uh, in the EU, the key requirements are provided in Article 35 of the GDPR. Um, the European Data Protection Board and the data protection authorities across the EU have provided additional guidance on what activities trigger an assessment or what activities are exempted. Um, all this to say, this is what the things that we were looking at as we, uh, as staff, I, I'll say, um, develop these risk assessment requirements. And, um, you know, just to highlight that we are thinking about harmonization where we can uh, and then where we need to be a little bit more um, forward thinking. So mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's any comment on that. It's just kind of. I mean, I, I will say, and I really, again, I appreciate all the thoughtful work on this. This is certainly a place where we can learn from what has come before, for sure, um, both in order to harmonize and also um, to adjust um, in some of the ways that that you were talking about, Mr. Lay, and, and we've been talking about. So I think, again, that this makes a lot of sense. And I'm also realizing how old I am because I have to always read European Data Protection Board twice because I always think Article 29 working group. <laughs> I have to translate it quickly in my head. Um, so, so the, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. I just wanted to, before we move to the next um, section, highlight one thing that's, I think, an important decision that we are moving towards um, as a subcommittee. Initially, we really gave a lot of thought to following the European approach which is a little different uh, formally. We had a great presentation to the board a few sessions back about this. And their approach is these um, nine factors that they have um, detail around. And the idea is if you trigger two of the nine, you need a data protection impact assessment. Um, we, we gave a lot of consideration to, to that possibility. But when we were looking at that and comparing it with the Colorado mm -hmm. approach, which is a little bit more, I think, aligned with the um, US um, legal framework, um, and it's a little bit more um, straightforward. So you don't have to go through nine activities and say, if you trigger two, then you have to do a data protection impact assessment. Rather, you go through specific identify activities like selling data processing um, personal data for targeted advertising, processing sensitive data, those will automatically per se trigger um, the data protection impact assessment. And after a lot of consideration, we thought that aligning a little closer with Colorado and perhaps not as close with um, the European Union was the right uh, potential approach for um, California. So I just wanna kind of, you know, be express about um, about that so that mm -hmm. we can um, gather hopefully a chairman urban support. I think that the fact in terms of you know what activities will be subject to the data protection impact assessment, it might be that net net is mm -hmm. the same in mm -hmm. Europe and uh, Colorado, but the the thought process, the analysis that goes into identifying them. It's going to be a little different. It's not mm -hmm. going to be nine activities you trigger to do mm -hmm. a data protection impact assessment. It's going to be there's a set list of activities. And if you meet any of these four or five mm -hmm. um, different um, bullet points, then you need a, uh, to do a data protection impact assessment. It, it, I'm probably being repetitive, and I'm sure that Chairman Urban already mm -hmm. gathered this, but I just wanted to be expressed about it. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Um, and again, I think the thinking makes sense. Um, of course, um, obviously the GDPR um, informs our law um, uh, quite quite clearly, and it's also a, a California law and, uh, and within the United States. And some of the assumptions, the baseline assumptions, are different. Um, uh, starting with when you can process, and you know, and how that's handled. So. Um, you know, I, I just, I think that it makes, I, I just think you have a lot of models for this particular 
um, for this particular requirement. There are a lot of risk assessment models out there, and it seems as though you and staff have been reviewing them all and, and, and matching them up to our law, and that makes sense to me. Right. Give my marker. <laughs> Apologies. And then before. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Before we move on to the next point, I just wanted to give an opportunity to staff to correct us if maybe we steer away from um, what is accurate. Corrections here, board member Delatore. And I do think one point that you raised does warrant emphasis, which is that these thresholds at the state level are generally interoperable with the GDPR approach. So for instance, if you are selling personal data, you've likely hit two of the nine factors mm -hmm. under EDPB. So as board member De La Torre pointed out, we'd likely end up in the same place. Mm -hmm. It's just a different way for businesses to assess how they actually, whether or not they need to do the risk assessment. Mm -hmm. And as board member De La Torre pointed out, um, having a clear list not only helps us with the OAL clarity standard, but of course, just from helping, um, just from the perspective of helping businesses with their own compliance and understanding when they need to conduct a risk assessment, there are some benefits to the state approach. Wonderful, thank you. All right, yeah, we'll move on to part three, automated decision-making technology. Uh, actually, I'll hand it off to board member Delatore. Thank you. Um, so again, the first slide that we see here is just a reminder of the authority uh, for rulemaking that um, this uh, agency has. Um, we can, can project it for a second and then move on to the next slide, please. Um, one thing that we um, gave a lot of consideration to is how uh, to define automated um, decision making technology. That's the terminology in our statute. I think that um, the fact that Member Lay was part of this committee was extremely helpful to consider all of the options. He has extensive experience in this area. Um, and again, we're not judging or stating that this should be the definition. We're still um, considering options. The staff is still uh, considering options, but we wanted to give the board a flavor of kind of where we are going at this point. Um, I can read it out loud. Automated decision and technology will mean any system, software, or process, including one derived from machine learning, statistics, or all the data processing or artificial intelligence techniques that processes personal information and uses computation as whole or part of a system to make or execute a decision or facilitate um, human decision-making. And um, we will be expressing, um, stating that ADMT um, includes uh, profiling. Um, what you see next to it is the definition of profiling within our law, which we will definitely, you know, we, we, we wouldn't change, it's just, um, Define the way it is defined. So um, I again defer to member ladies. Yeah. Seems to me to be a, a rather broad um, definition of ADMT, which will be comprehensive, and that's how we're thinking about it. But concrete enough to enable organizations to assess whether a particular technology is um, uh, automated decision making technology, and then this, the second layer, which we will um, uh, point in this conversation in the next slide is, you know, what rights does it trigger? That, 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 that there's a question of what technology we're defining and then what happens when this um, technology is used in terms of the rights that we will um, grant on California residents. So let me pause here and- let yeah, I'll, add, I'll add really quickly to that, you know, I mean, a staff synthesizes this definition for multiple frameworks, you know, civil rights commissions propose modifications, implement regulations, um, the Office of Science and Technology Blueprint for uh, mm -hmm. the AI Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of definitions floating around. Um, there is no one that's going to make every single stakeholder happy. Mm -hmm. And I think we, um, the subcommittee and staff, have kind of threaded that needle to pick one that covers what we think should be covered. And we have, you know, these thresholds well, who the CCPA applies to and these other kind of checks on making sure that, you know, this, def this definition um, on its own doesn't trigger a lot of things, right? You, you have to, to do a risk assessment under this definition, you have to be, you know, 
regulated by the CCPA, you also have to hit these thresholds. So um, yeah, I think this is kind of a good first step uh, at our definition as we approach, you know, a more final rulemaking that will actually finalize this. Thank you. Yes, I recognize bits and pieces. <laughs> um, uh, so, so thank you for that. I think I, I just like to hear the the whole. The whole. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's move on to the next slide, please. Um, and I think that's a wise <laughs> um, point here. So, the fact that uh, technology might be within the definition of ATMT, um, the way we're thinking about it will not automatically trigger. Um, uh, access and opt-out rights, only ADMT that meets certain thresholds will trigger those rights we have listed, um, what we think will be, or, or how we're thinking about reasonable thresholds. I'm going to read them out loud. Um, so uh, if the use, if the ADMT is using partners of a decision that results in the provision or denial of financial or lending services, housing, insurance, education, enrollment, or opportunity, uh, criminal justice, employment, or contracting opportunities, or compensation, healthcare services, or access to essential goods, services, and opportunities. That's number one. Number two, uh, the use of ADMT to monitor or surveil employees, independent contractors, job applicants, or students. Uh, number three will be um, uh, use of ADMT to track the behavior, location, movements, or actions of consumers in publicly accessible places. Uh, at this point, the subcommittee feels that that those three will be um, good um, points or um, thresholds to recommend for implementation. Again, um, this is a very complex area. This, this language is not final. We're just trying to bring some information to the board on how we're thinking about this. Um, the second list that you will see there, um, there are additional thresholds that we are recommending for potential discussion. They might not need to be enacted in this initial package, but maybe they should be considered for future packages. Um, or perhaps, you know, if the board supports it and that's the preference, we could consider including them in the initial package. Um, so the first one is processes the personal information of consumers that the business has actual knowledge are less than 16 years of age. Um, and the second one will be process of personal information of consumers to train um, ADMT systems. Um, those are more, um, I think they, they will be more um, new and maybe you, you don't find them in other Mm -hmm. uh, frameworks, um, either state frameworks or international frameworks, although should double check with the staff that that's the case. Um, but let me pause here, um, just remind uh, Chairman Irvin that this is not the only opportunity to have a conversation about this. It's a very complex area. We just try to be thoughtful and, and, and gather some feedback from the, from the board in terms of how we're thinking about it right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a, you know, I think I, I think I need to hold my my question um, for a little while um, until we finish the this, the overview of the of the ADMT um, part because everything is is interrelated as, as you well know. I the rest of the appendix and just yeah. as a reminder you know it's perfectly okay to you know bring your questions and we will check with the staff it might not be that we can answer those questions right now but even the awareness of the question will be beneficial because it will give staff an opportunity to prepare answers um for you to be presented in future board um, mm -hmm. meetings yeah so i i was um i re i read the appendix as well earlier <laughs> and so i was uh, i think i was thinking of slide 23 which provides um some some further some further information um yes you know i so i think it's probably a good time to talk about um process and, and next steps uh because I am wondering how to put together the language in the statute that talks about um, opt-out and 
meaningful information for automated decision making, including profiling. Um, and I think I'm reading this as some subset of profiling would be covered. Um, and I just need to think about, you know, what I think about the subset that's identified here um, versus other kinds of profiling um, that might arise. But that's something that, again, I think will be, I can be more constructive um, as you continue to flesh this out. Uh, and so this is, first of all, this is just really impressive. Um, so to um, Ms. Anderson and Ms. Shake and to both of you, I mean, this is just really impressive as we all know, this is a this is a very rapidly developing area and yet somehow there's just a lot of um, opinions out there <laughs> about how to go about it. Um, it's rapidly developing technologically, um, societally, uh, and uh, we have the opportunity to lead, um, but of course we want to do this um, in, in, in the best way, um, both for California consumers um, and thinking about what it would mean for businesses. So again, I just, I really think that the approach that you're taking here is a very good one. Um, and I'm looking forward to some of the sort of fleshed out um, uh, information about, again, what's gonna be required for things like cybersecurity audits and risk assessments, how that interacts with, with the thresholds, um, how some of this might play out. So um, what it, would it mean for a business to allow somebody to opt out? You know, at what point in the decision-making what would the consumer need to do in order to opt out? Would there be exception? You know, these kinds of things, all of the, they are all related um, to whether the thresholds are the right thresholds or not. Um, so I, I oops, sorry, uh, I got animated. <laughs> that was a bad idea. Um, uh, so, so I very much look forward to that. Um, and then in terms of process, um, let me just, let me just do not feel tied to this, okay? I'm just gonna tell you what would be great from my perspective and everybody can tell me if that works or not. What would be fantastic from my perspective would be um, for some of the more detailed information. And I don't know if that's in the form of memos or a draft ISOR, maybe some uh, draft regulatory language, that would be an obvious choice. Um, if that were available, um, to the board um, sometime with some copious time before the next meeting for the board to think about, that would be wonderful. Um, if it were possible um, for the board um, to offer maybe written feedback the way we did on the um, request for comments, that would be wonderful. I don't know if that would be before the next board discussion or after. I realize that if we start if the staff start collecting board written feedback like that, then we have to give it to the staff um, because we end up with um, a, we end up um, having to think about bad we keen. So I'm completely open as to like when that would happen. I would just like to have the chance for that at some point because um, the complexity yeah. of the of the topic um, lends itself, at least for me, um, to that kind of feedback at some point. Um, but regardless, um, if we could have a discussion at the next level of complexity, um, whatever that is, and if, you know, if everybody's ready to like have a draft regulatory package, that's great. Or if it's something in between, that's great um, that we could start looking at um, before the next meeting. That would be from, from my point of view, um, sort of selfishly, um, I think that would allow me to be very constructive, but I'm very open to other options as well. I, I think that that's that's a conversation that maybe you know we should have because I don't know that um, the subcommittee we we have kind of iron out how this will work and um, anything that we say is subject to the staff being able to mm -hmm. um, complete you know yeah the I'm task. sorry I was actually that I I was addressing but, everybody but my um, vision for this package and I think this subcommittee vision for this package is to do things in a way that's different from how we do it. I did it for the uh, first package. There is a lot of urgency around uh, getting that first package to be in final. We have a little bit more space here. And so what we, how I'm envisioning this package is 
we front load the board conversation so that we can gather feedback and consolidate a draft before we start the formal rulemaking process. And that um, entails um, things um, like the ones that um, Chairman, uh, Chairwoman Irvan suggested. I, I apologize, and this is not my I mean, first language, so I <laughs> constantly. Um, uh, so ideally, we um, are envisioning bringing to the board um, draft regulations way ahead of the um, time where we have to finalize them with the understanding that there will be drafts. So there can be a space for changing things. We have to make sure that you know the, the staff is ready to um, provide those. I think that um, they will not come as a whole package. Is is they? Um, I think we could think about, for example, having the draft on cybersecurity, which I think is 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 more um, close to being able to be um, shared with the board in a meeting. Hopefully, maybe perhaps the next meeting. And then after that, providing um, these other two topics separately uh, to the board. Um, I want to um, pause for a second and, and rethink what I, yes, I, th I think that that would be, I'm very confident that given the, um, we are, apologies, we are, we, the subcommittee has working drafts for all these three sections. They're just not at the same level of kind of, maturity to mm -hmm. be presented to the board. So I do anticipate that the first one that might be available to present to the board is cybersecurity. And hopefully, you know, in the next meeting, but we would like to ask a little bit of space to uh, go back to the staff and make sure that, that that's realistic. And uh, yeah, I'll add to that. Yeah, we do have working drafts, you know, some of the 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 teeth and how this interacts with opt-outs and what is meaningful information. Um, I think we have that, and I think we're going to try to get it out as, as quickly as we can. Uh, I want to give ourselves space in case we can't and, and staff works, but I, I think my, yeah, my preference is, you know, I, I would love for you all to have those in a final form. Um, well, a, in a form that you can more accurately discuss these regulations by September. Um, I'm not sure if it'll be everything that mm -hmm. uh, you'd like, but um, I think we can commit to working as fast as we can as a subcommittee and staff to, yeah, get you as much draft regulatory language as as we can. Um, so, because we don't want, yeah, um, September meeting to have these same questions about how, how do things interact. Um, yes, I apologize. If, yeah. But no, you know, I, I if, will have the same questions mm -hmm. if I were, you know, um, not part yeah. of this, and, because it's totally understandable. Yeah, and I guess this this was just to make sure that we weren't very off base, right? Okay. And um, that, I don't think you're off base. Yeah, so we just wanted to do the gut check to make sure that we're not making staff draft, uh, you know, a bunch of regulations that we will have to throw away and and, and start all over with if things don't go well with the, the full board. So, um, yeah, we wanted this initial steer, um, but things are, uh, yeah, relatively far along, and we can just see if we can get that out before September. Okay. I mean, so, I don't and also don't mean to to rush you in any way. Um, and I'm one board member. So um obviously there may be different and additional there will be additional views, maybe somewhat different views um in September, but to the extent that I can offer my general sense that I don't think you're off base, <laughs> um, I'm very happy to do that and um appreciate that. Now I would like to ask if staff had any um I, I wanted to address yeah. two things before we go to the staff. One of the questions that you had around you know providing um comments uh, or, or reading um feedback to staff. Yeah. Um I I think that should be a priority to figure out how we can enable other board members to participate in the final drafting of um of, of of the rules. I'm not sure logistically um how we are going to accomplish that, but I think it should be a priority so that if um uh, you wanted to perhaps suggest a, a different steer on, on the language of a particular provision, we can ensure that you have the resources available from the staff to be able to offer that um alternative. 
Um, and, and the second thing that I wanted to um, mention, and I'm sure that when we get the comments from the staff will come up, is that we do anticipate that this package will meet the thresholds to require uh, assessment, a financial assessment. So that is in part another like logistical mm -hmm. uh, piece that we have to make sure that uh, we have in place. This initial presentation in part is meant to um, help staff understand at least the threshold so that we can hopefully start the work mm -hmm. to prepare that assessment um, as soon as possible because it would take time. And um, we are aware of the fact that, you know, residents of California are waiting on us to finalize, to, to get rights that um, we want to um, offer it to them as soon as, as, as possible. And uh, the, the final comment that I wanted to make is from my perspective, there are other priorities for the agency, but this is a key priority to finalize these rules as soon as possible. Because again, there's you know, 40 million um, people, residents of California that we wanna um, serve and we wanna make sure that we don't delay their access to the rights that we're gonna and the protections that we're gonna grant these rules. Um, so with that, I wanna pause. I know that staff will, will have comment, particularly uh, on this um, additional process that uh, will exist for these rules because we anticipate we will meet the thresholds for um, that economic assessment. Uh, I before. Should be good. Great. Um, I'll just echo that, yeah, we are um, under taking the, or we're, we're currently trying to move in parallel on the economic analysis to determine the, the, whether it meets the threshold and begin that process since it takes additional time. And I'll just echo that it is the priority. Um, this package is a priority. And so we're dedicating significant resources to it. Okay, thank you. And feel free to just take what I said about what would be helpful to me and work with it as it works um, in order to balance the need um, for the package to be efficiently created and put together and for the board to give the feedback that we need to, to give on it. Um, and if it is helpful, um, yes, I'm in full agreement. This, this is a priority. These are very important topics. Um, they are in the initiative that Californians voted for um, and we wanna get them right. And we also wanna get them done um, and available for both businesses and consumers. So, um, you know, you've heard what I thought, I think. Um, hopefully that was somewhat helpful. I mean, I found this tremendously useful and um, uh, again, really commend everybody who's been working on it. Uh, the last comment that I wanted to make in terms of process is I think that we should anticipate for future meetings that it's highly likely that this subcommittee will have a presentation on virtually you know, all yep. meetings until we finalize the uh, package. And we wanted to create flexibility in that so that maybe thoughts that didn't come up in this conversation, um, you know, you might think about it over the two months and, and make sure that we can in, intake that input um, in the next meeting. So we wanna create flexibility there. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. All right, with that, um, I'd like to ask for any public comments on this item. Um, Chair, it looks like we do have one public commenter, Stephanie Wonk. I'm going to unmute you at this time, and you'll have three minutes to make your uh, public comment. So go ahead and begin whenever you're ready. Hi, can you hear me? Try, okay. try again. Hello? Hello. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Stephanie Wong, and I am a policy fellow at the Future Privacy Forum. FPF is a nonprofit think tank that focuses on consumer privacy and helping policymakers, privacy professionals, academics, and advocates find consensus around responsible business practices for emerging technology. I have three comments for the subcommittee to consider regarding the potential definition of ADMT and potential thresholds for ADMT access and opt-out rights. 
Given the breadth of the proposed definition of ADMT, it is unclear what opting out would entail or how it would work in practice. Under the GDPR, individuals have the right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing, including profiling, which produces legal effects concerning or similarly significantly affecting them. In contrast, the agency's proposed definition of ADMT is not focused on solely automated decisions or final decisions, but appears to extend to the use of any computational processing that furthers a human decision. In practice, this definition could require businesses to make decisions that are necessary to provide services without the use of common tools such as word processors, calculators, and Excel sheets. Second, the agency's proposed language on ADMT also introduces several new terms that are not defined under the CCPA, specifically the terms monitor, track, and surveil. All three terms can be seen to have similar but distinct definitions while still overlapping with the CCPA's regulation of data collection. In proceeding, we encourage the board to clearly define each of these terms and explain their direct correlation to algorithmic decision-making. In departing from the common legal or similarly significant effects standard for opt-out thresholds, the proposed text could prove over-inclusive, particularly in granting absolute opt-out rights to parties such as employees or students. We encourage the board to consider how the proposed definitions and thresholds would impact common practices. For example, would students be allowed to opt out of proctoring or anti-plagiarism software? Would a user that is under age 16 be able to opt out of a rideshare that uses GPS to determine an optimal route? And would an employee have an absolute right to opt out of a program that allocates and tracks hours worked and vacation time? Finally, as the agency proceeds in drafting regulations to clarify access rights, we encourage considering whether an organization sits as either a developer or deployer of an ADMT system. Developers and deployers have varied contractual and structural means to have access, transparency, or even control of AI systems. The ability of developers to provide meaningful information or ensure cybersecurity protections while doing so will vary depending on a variety of factors. Thank you for your time and consideration of these important issues. Thank you very much, Stephanie Wong. Is there further public comment? This is for agenda item six, new CPRA rules subcommittee update. If you'd like to speak on this agenda item at this time, please go ahead and raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature by pressing star nine if you're joining us by phone. Again, this is public comment for agenda item six, new CPRA rules subcommittee update. If you'd like to make a comment, please go ahead and raise your hand or press star nine. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any further hands. Thank you very much, Mr. Sapo, and thanks for um, the comment. Thank you again to the New Roles Subcommittee um, for all the thought and work that went into this and to your um, very helpful presentation um, and to uh, Ms. Sheikh and Ms. Anderson for your work and others, I'm sure there are others um, for your work um, on the topic. Let's move to agenda item number seven, which is a demonstration of the agency's new consumer complaint system. I am personally very excited to see this, um, and it will be presented by Elizabeth Allen, the CPPA special advisor. Um, Ms. Allen, when you're ready, please go ahead. And everyone bear with us while we set up. Is there a URL I can go to? Okay. Otherwise, I think I might be able to just turn all the way around. Okay, I think I see it. You see it? Yeah, file a complaint, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Liz Allen, and I am proud to announce that after months of work, the CPPA has soft, la soft launched our complaint system last week. So we're excited to give you a quick tour and to see if you had any feedback. Um, 
Okay, so you can see that we have, you can get to the complaint from three different locations. The first is on our homepage at this bottom bar. You can also go up to the navigation bar and, and click through up here. And if you go to frequently asked questions, um, we have a new section, very exciting down here, entitled filing a complaint with the CPPA. Here we have um, added five FAQs addressing the most commonly asked questions, such as how to file a complaint, how to write a helpful complaint, and what happens after you file a complaint. And of course, we created the actual complaint system uh, itself. <laughs> so this is um, an online, this is the online form. It was designed to be simple and easy for the public to use. We want to gather as much information as possible as a new agency because we want to know the, the privacy issues and experiences of the California consumers. Our statute directs us to accept both sworn and unsworn complaints in 1798.199.45. This single form collects both, as well as contains the important disclaimer that our agency, of course, does not represent individuals. On the back end, um, the complaints come into the agency. Um, as a CSV file where we review, label, and sort the complaints as appropriate. We're gonna, we'll do a quick um, tour through the questions and uh, move on from there. So first we have the uh, description of the various rights that um, the complainant can, can uh, choose and select as a possible violation of the CPPA. An identification of the business or service provider, contractor, or person. Um, that they believe violated the CPPA or the CCPA, apologies, um, whether the person is a California resident, a narrative of the complaint, as well as a description of any supporting materials, such as like a screenshot of a, of a business interface or an email exchange between the business and the consumer, um, whether the person already reached out or contacted um, the alleged violator, and then importantly, in number seven, um, folks can toggle between an unsworn or sworn complaint. The sworn complaint, when you check it, um, some of the contact information becomes required. And the, at the bottom, the form must be signed under um, penalty of perjury. We collect op optional uh, contact information and then optional information um, about uh, the alleged violator, including their website, their data privacy officer contact, um, et cetera. And here at the bottom, um, you, the person can sign and then hit complete. So that is the form. And um, since our soft launch, which was July 6th, so about a week ago, we've actually received 13 com uh, complaints through the form. Um, the average individual complainant identifies four possible uh, CCPA violations. 77% of those complaints were sworn, 54% were submitted from California residents, uh, and the right to limit the use of sensitive personal information was the most frequently alleged violation. Uh, second to that was right to know and right to delete, which were tied. So we are thrilled to be live. Um, it, this was so much work um, with our small team, including the indefatigable Julie Hall in our legal support division and the gracious Ron Mendoza, who was head of IT. Um, it also include, included countless hours with the Department of Consumer Affairs to create the back end of this. And it was actually quite the lift. So thank you to everyone who beta tested the form and provided feedback. Um, we are thrilled to be hearing from the public about their privacy issues and concerns. Do you have any uh, feedback or questions about the form? And Ashkan, go ahead. <laughs> uh, just thanks, staff, for putting this together. I'm so uh, happy that the um, uh, agency, as you know, has very limited IT resources and expertise. And Liz Allen and Julie Hall have pinch hit for multiple roles to do this. So, so um, I'm very impressed that we got this off the ground and we home, home grow this solution. So thank you. Thank you both. And thank you to everyone else. Ron too. Wonderful. Um, thank you, um, Ms. Allen. I will um, defer to Mr. Lay and Ms. De La Torre first and then um, have some comments. Yep. Uh, yeah, I would like to second, uh, you know, congratulations to the staff for being able to put this together, uh, short timeline and, and short on resources. Um, 
So I, I think, uh, yeah, this is exactly the type of thing, you know, I'd like to see from the agency and I'm really happy to see it here. And as it comes towards, you know, other tools for the public and for businesses, whether it's submitting risk assessments or, um, you know, certifying they did cybersecurity audits or things like that, I'd love to see these types of tools available as we grow uh, our agency and, and our IT staff, um, just to make compliance easier where we can. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Um, thank you. I, I want to second what um, has already been shared. Um, thank you to the executive director for thinking about this project and to the staff that put it together. I, I do have a few um, thoughts, and my thoughts are not meant to, in any way, um, detract from my um, congratulations on, on getting this together. But as I was looking through it, I was thinking about accessibility. So one of the things that I was thinking in terms of accessibility is this form is only in English. We do have um, extensive um, population in California who are residents who might not speak English. Is this, um, I know this is you know the initial version, are we thinking about expanding this by adding other languages? I can take that. Um, we're thinking about it for across the website uh, accessibility as a whole. We've done the survey of what, uh, or we, we've done a kind of informal survey of what languages, and it's included actually in our media and outreach um, contract to have translation services. And we're thinking about potentially two ways of doing it. One is to explicitly translate a bunch of the different portions of the site. Uh, the second is potentially implementing um, some some third-party plugins, assuming we can find ones that maintain our privacy values that do dynamic accessibility, not only for language, but there's st stuff that for colorblind, for people that can't see contrast, for hearing impaired. And so we're exploring that as part of kind of the IT roadmap. Um, so it's definitely on the radar. This is very much a kind of a very early version. You know, when we evaluated other states that have done this, they've done long-term, year-long procurements with you know, large companies implementing them, third parties. We chose to do it in-house, both so that we could gain the learning ourselves, get something out there. And then two, again, we have particular privacy preferences about using third parties. We want to give ourselves a chance to contract with those privacy priorities as well as accessibility priorities. So it's definitely on the roadmap. It's just, um, this was kind of, we wanted to get something out there by July. Perfect, thank you. So on, on the accessibility piece, um, the, not everybody is comfortable with using the internet. Um, are we thinking about creating a 1-800 number uh, in addition to this uh, or a mailing address where people can actually uh, mail their complaints? Um, yeah, we do have a paper complaint form so people can, uh, and I can show it to you real quick. It's essentially the same, but it's a PDF where people can print it out and mail it to the agency. And we also have our, our agency phone, phone line number. that directs yeah. people uh, to on how to uh, file complaints on uh, by the phone. Uh, the last question that I have, and this is something that um, was part of the conversation when we talked about um, updates to the existing rules, it will be very helpful if when a consumer receives a denial of a right a notification from a business or otherwise the business communicates in terms of in any of the requests to um, uh, have a requirement that that denial contain a reference to you have the right to complain to um, either our agency or the uh, or, uh, office of, um, sorry, uh, or the um, attorney general. Uh, I know that's more on the rulemaking side, you know, making that update, but but you do anticipate that this will be kind of compatible, that if, if the rules were updated to include that requirement, that they, you know, people could be potentially one click away uh, to uh, file in their, their complaint. Yeah, I don't see it as, as incompatible. And I think whether that's a rulemaking requirement um, in regulation or if it's a legislative fix, we'd have, be happy to explore it. Um, there's also other practical fa functions, which is, you know, as you know, in Europe, there's a requirement to have a data protection officer listed. Um, that same requirement doesn't exist here. We've asked consumers to provide what information they can provide about the, the subject of their complaint, but there are probably other um, policy fixes that could help consumers exercise their rights writ large 
identify the target, et cetera. So um, there's nothing incompatible. And again, this is very much designed to take feedback. So appreciate your feedback. And we anticipate as we grow, um, we will implement a much more robust system as part of our media and outreach planning, including redesigning the website and, and creating new features. But this gets it done and, and we have a paper version we have. So um, this was very much designed to get us started. Again, thank you so much for the great work. I, um, I love that we were able to launch it and I, I appreciate that now, you know, consumers can complain and somehow seven, uh, 16 already found their, their um, way to us. And um, so it is a very exciting um, development for the agency. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I said, I was very excited about this and I remain very excited about it. I know to a lot of people, this may look fairly simple, but there is a lot of work um, I can imagine from other projects I've done in my other life um, on the back end um, for this. So I really thank and commend um, Ms. Allen and Mr. Mendoza um, and Ms. Hall for all and everybody for all of the work to get this out and get it available to the public and to have it available for the agency so that we can learn um, what people are experiencing and best direct um, our enforcement, um, uh, our, enfor our enforcement, and and how we think about rulemaking, and how we think about um, uh, public awareness. You know what things people need to be able to understand, uh, both to rectify their rights, and also if there are limits to the rights that they're not understanding. And it's just going to be very valuable, I think. I wanted to especially say I'm um, building a little bit on what Ms. De La Torre said. Um, and, I, and I fully support everything she said about improvements for accessibility and so forth. Um, but related to that, I really appreciate how integrated um, uh, this is and how you've been thinking about how the pieces work together. So there's a complaint tool, but there's also an FAQ that explains it. Um, uh, I assume that this will be um, part of public awareness materials so that people know about it and they know how to use it. Uh, and I just, I just really um, commend everybody for it because I think this is a key part of our function. Um, I am looking forward to um, learning what we can learn um, from the complaints that come in. Um, thank you, Ms. Allen, for giving us those very early statistics, which, you know, it's only a few. So what can you say about 54% of 17 or whatever? Um, but we will eventually have more information. Um, and in line with what our general counsel advises and you know what um, what makes sense. Um, I personally would really value periodically hearing, um, getting a report um, about what's being observed from the complaint system. Um, to the extent that that's possible um, under our various constraints, I think that would be valuable for the board, um, again, to understand sort of where priorities might be, be valuable for the public um, and would be valuable for businesses. Um, because to the extent that um, their practices are mismatched with what consumers are expecting or not, right, or they're successful, I think it would be very helpful for them to sort of see this and understand it um, and to hear us um, talk about it so they can see that our reactions to that. So that would be wonderful. Um, I, you know, it's not a huge priority given all of our priorities, but I think that it would be very helpful. Um, and again, I just, you know, thank you, um, everybody to this, because I just think it's key that the public actually, that the public has this kind of interface with the agency. Um, and this is a wonderful way um, to do it, um, especially um, as we're so small. Mr. Sultani. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, I appreciate all the, all the, all the wonderful feedback. And indeed, um, we do anticipate providing kind of periodic updates to the board and the public about um, the type, you know, not the specifics of the complaints, but the type and nature. Mm -hmm. I think it will inform both um, not only on enforcement, but really our rulemaking mm -hmm. and our public awareness and public education. Um, as Ms. Allen laid out, this was a soft launch. We were waiting to um, promote it much more broadly um, after this board meeting. So uh, we plan to to um, we're, we're currently, as you know, as I mentioned in the budget update, we're waiting on an update on our media and outreach um contract hopefully that will execute soon but separately we plan to promote this on the various um kind of public outreach channels initially to get to drive consumers to it and then make it a core piece of our public awareness 
um, efforts, which we then will report back to the board. Um, and I think we are also um, going to integrate it as kind of as part of our larger campaign. And um, we currently um, have some positive developments on how to make it simpler for consumers, California consumers and citizens to not only find our complaint system, but how to coordinate between our complaints and the DOJ's complaints and creating portals for both submitting complaints for business guidance for education. And so we're going to have some positive developments in that area, I think, quite soon, um, which we'll report back to the uh, board. And this will be a key piece of it. Um, but starting kind of next week, we will plan to start. We already have Ms. Um, uh, uh, Ms. White is here. Um, we, we plan to uh, put together a roadmap for promoting the complaint system early on. Um, there's also an issue of we don't manage our IT. So what kind, you know, if mm -hmm. we get a million complaints, then there's a there's a, another thing. And that, you know, we're 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 mindful of that. Um so yeah, so uh, absolutely we will plan to to report back. And I, again, I just want to give my thanks to to staff um uh for kind of uh going above and beyond and getting this together. Julie Hall and 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 Juan Mendoza who are, can't be here, but they're um, instrumental as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, thank you. Uh, with that, um, Mr. Uh, Sabo, um, could you let us know if there's any public comment on this item online? And if there's anyone here in person, I'd like to invite you um, to come to the podium if you'd like to make public comments on the item. Yes, this is for agenda item seven, consumer complaint system demonstration. If you'd like to speak on this item under public comment at this time, please go ahead and raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. Again, this is for agenda item seven, consumer complaint system demonstration. This is the final call for public comment on agenda item seven. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands right now. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Sabo. Again, thanks so much, Ms. Allen um, and team, and we will look forward to um, the fruits of the complaint system um, and being available to the public in this way. I encourage everybody um, to check it out. Let's move to agenda item number eight, which is an overview of the agency's enforcement process. This will be presented by Mr. Phil Laird, our general counsel. Uh, Mr. Laird, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Urban and members of the board. Uh, first of all, it's good to be back with you all. I'm happy to share with everyone here that uh, my wife and I welcomed uh, two beautiful identical girls to the world in April. And it's so uh, twins are a lot, but uh, they're learning our way for sure. Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to thank staff. Um, all right. Is this any better? Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, all right. There we go. Okay. So, uh, first of all, great to be back. Secondly, I did want to take the opportunity to just thank the staff that supported uh, uh, supported me while I was out and helped oversee the legal division. Uh, special thanks to Mr. Nelson Richards. Brian Souble, Lisa Kim, as well as the whole legal division that has done an outstanding job in my absence. Um, and finally, I just want to recognize, I know it's four o'clock on what's already been a six hour board meeting, so I'll try to keep my remarks short, but you know, on point here. Um, so for this agenda item, I am providing to the board a general overview of the administrative enforcement process uh, as detailed in both our law, the CCPA and the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, as well as some high-level guidance around board member conduct now that our agency's enforcement authority has vested. Um, so this own overview I'm, is now... I'm sorry to in interrupt you, Mr. Laird, but there was a presentation, I think, in the materials. There is. Going to use there, that? Or? Yeah, I, I would like to use that. Um, okay. wait, <laughs> I was waiting to see if... <laughs> oh, apologies. Wonderful. All, All right. right. Thank you. Apologies for interrupting. And I think everybody at this point knows that I will ask them to direct their attention to the materials for this agenda item. Right. All right, wonderful. Um, and so, uh, and I just wanna mention this overview is not only for the board's benefit, but also for the public and regulated industries edification on agencies enforcement process and boundaries. 
Um, so beginning with uh, the presentation we were just referring to, um, uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. I will be specifically covering uh, the topics in the agenda, uh, background on adjudicative proceedings, CPPA administrative enforcement process, ex parte communications, bias and prejudice, and an impermissible interest in the proceeding. So uh, I'll unpack all of that over the next few minutes. Uh, please go to the next slide. So in tandem with the phrase enforcement action, you'll often hear us also use the phrase adjudicative proceeding. While the former may refer to all stages of administrative enforcement action from complaint and investigation to final disposition, the latter really refers to the actual hearing and decision process. And the APA defines an administrative proceeding as an evidentiary hearing for determination of facts pursuant to which an agency formulates and issues a decision. Um, in simple terms, this is the trial. And in fact, an administrative hearing really operates much like a mini trial. Um, there's a prosecutor, which is in our case will be the enforcement division and a defendant or respondent, um, which will be a regulated business that we have jurisdiction over who has been accused of violating the CCPA. And they both will have the opportunity to present evidence and make arguments about whether or not the violation has occurred. Um, now, um, the bed, uh, let's see, I'm realizing uh, I should ask you to go ahead and move to the next slide, Mr. Sabo, and then I'll keep going. Uh, all right. So yeah, actually, yeah, you, we can stay there, but I'm not quite there. I, I'm, fo I'm following my notes finally. Now, the bedrock of a fair trial is the concept of due process, which requires not only a balanced and equal presentation of facts and arguments to the decision makers, but also requires that decision makers not be biased or prejudiced against either party or give either party exclusive opportunities to present information. More on that in a bit. Okay. Now, turning your attention to this uh, sort of process overview, um, this is to give everyone a very, very bare bones sense of what a typical administrative enforcement action will entail. First, the enforcement division will open an investigation, and this can occur in any number of ways, including based on a complaint received through our uh, um, system that was just demonstrated, uh, as well as on the enforcement division's own initiative. Deputy Director Michael Macko will be presenting next on exactly what his enforcement priorities and strategy will be, but one thing to note is that the target of an investigation may not always be aware that there's an investigation going on against them, and the law does not require such notice. Next, and this is fairly unique to our agency, the Enforcement Division will file what's called a Notice of Probable Cause Proceeding. This will provide the target of an investigation notice that the Enforcement Division is alleging they have violated the CCPA as well as a summary of the evidence they've collected. The alleged violator will be notified of their right to representation and the date of the hearing to determine whether probable cause has been established um, that the violation has potentially occurred. Pursuant to the delegation that we'll be considering a little bit later today, um, this probable cause hearing would be carried out by the legal division, who until this point will have no knowledge of the investigation or the alleged violations due to the internal separation of functions our agency has implemented. I should note that this follows the same process that the FPPC uses, who is actually the only other state entity that has uh, is mandated to hold these probable cause hearings. Once a finding of probable cause has been made by the legal division, the action then proceeds pretty much like any other administrative proceeding in the state. The adjudicated proceedings are carried out primarily by what's called the Office of Administrative Hearings, another state entity, but that's separate from our agency, who, like a courthouse, assigns an administrative law judge to preside over the hearing. This begins with the enforcement division filing what's called an accusation, which is akin to a complaint or a petition, and then the matter continues with briefing and an evidentiary hearing. At the conclusion of the hearing, the administrative law judge renders a proposed decision to the agency. This is where the agency board comes in. Once a proposed decision has been rendered, the board will be given the opportunity to review and deliberate on the proposed decision and the underlying record during a closed session of a regularly no noticed board meeting. The board will ultimately vote on whether to adopt, reject, or modify the proposed decision. If the board adopts the decision, then the decision and the order become final, essentially a final judgment. If the board rejects or modifies the decision, it must prepare its own written reasons for doing so with support from legal division staff. The penalties authorized by the CCPA are an order to cease and desist activities that violate the CCPA and fines ranging from $2,500 to $7,500 per violation. 
Now, I know that's a lot I, I just covered in terms of the process. As I said, it's very bare bones, but I will take a moment here to ask if board members have any questions about that process. Nope. All right, I'll continue then to the next slide, Mr. Sabo, thank you. Um, so given the board's role as a final adjudicator or judge, some might say there are a number of prohibitions included in the Administrative Procedures Act meant to ensure due process is upheld in administrative proceedings. The first prohibition is on ex parte communications, and the APA defines ex parte communication as a direct or indirect communication to a board member from a party or interested person about a pending adjudicative proceeding that occurs without notice and the opportunity for all parties to participate in the communication. Now, this means, with some limited exceptions, that board members cannot talk to a party to the proceeding, including enforcement division staff, about the proceeding while the matter is pending. Additionally, this prohibition extends generally to interested persons, which can include trade groups and industry representatives. So that's sort of ex parte in a nutshell. I'll just kind of keep running through the various prohibitions now. So next slide, please. Um, so another prohibition against... Uh, uh, Sorry, that, could I ask? Yeah, absolutely. Could I ask you a quick question on that? Um, so other interested parties. So um, someone who might, in a court setting, file an amicus brief because they... I mean, an amicus brief is a friend of the court, but might try to intervene, I suppose, but they're not the business that is actually the subject of the adjudicative proceeding. They're not the defendant. Um, and That's correct. And, I, you know, I think I think we're aware there's a lot of trade groups that represent yeah. different types of industries or different types of businesses who often will advocate for um, even certain outcomes in, in an administrative proceeding because, you know, they want what's best for mm -hmm. their businesses they represent. So, um that would be another instance where maybe it's not a direct party, but it is somebody who's established, has a, a pretty clearly uh, um, observed interest in the outcome of the proceeding and uh, the benefit it might have on their organization or their representatives. Um, and that the same rules would apply with them. Okay, it, thank you. I, I have a question also on the ex parte communications. We had a prior meeting of the board where this was discussed to some extent, and I just wanted to get some clarity as to at what point of the administrative enforcement process this ex parte communication pro prohibition is triggered. Be mindful of the fact that for the initial part of the enforcement process, the board might, um, in reality, you will not know that an enforcement is going on. Um, and as I understand it, is when the enforcement division files the accusation under the Office of Administrative Hearings. At that point, this will become, you know, officially filed. It will be public, and I and the board will be enforced and informed. So, um, will it be correct in assuming that that's the point where the ex parte communication um, obligation is is triggered for the board members? Uh, that, that's a great question, uh, Board Member De La Torre. Uh, absolutely, by that stage, I would say yes. Uh, once there is a public filing, and you know anybody, including board members, are made aware that there is now a public action against an administrative action against a target by our agency, um, certainly we'd ask that you observe these ex parte uh, prohibitions. Um, I will add the extra caveat, you know, as you know, there is um, a little bit more confidentiality baked into the law around the probable cause hearing proceedings. Um, so there may be a situation where a board member is not aware at that point that a matter is sort of brewing, so to speak, um, but may then, you know, a, a representative of a business may come to you saying, hey, we got this notice of probable cause proceeding. Um, even if you were made aware at that point that that's what they wanted to discuss with you, I would still recommend um, that you treat that as a, as, as a moment in time when you should no longer continue the conversation. So certainly at the accusation stage, but uh, anybody trying to speak really with board members about an investigation or the beginnings of an enforcement proceeding against them, it would be the recommendation of the legal division that board members um, abstain from that. Uh, let me repeat back to make sure that I understood it correctly. So um, at the time of the filing, it will become public. The board will be informed, uh, informed clearly the expert communication pro prohibition kicks in. Before um, that filing, we could become aware of it because a party brings it to our attention or it becomes public because a party decides to you know, go public with it. Um, 
And we should be really prudent the moment that we understand that uh, we have awareness of that. And um, will it be correct to assume that the legal division will be available for board members to reach out and obtain advice if we um, think or suspect, or maybe even before having actual knowledge, we you know, we might have a conversation where we think, oh, well, this is a little bit of a red flag. Let me um, make sure that, you know, I, I beyond the regular caution that we observe in general absent enforcement, and maybe I have to do something else. Will the legal division be the right, um, uh, I guess, um, the right um, section of the agency to reach out to for advising them. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a service we are more than happy to provide. And again, because of the separation within our agency, please do contact the legal division as opposed to Mr. Macko and the enforcement division. Thank you so much. So unless there are any no, other questions, please, please go ahead. Um, I, I'd like to move to the next slide, please. Um, so another prohibition against uh, certain board member conduct is um, around concepts of being biased or prejudiced um, against a party. So as the slide explains, bias generally refers to a lack of impartiality towards a party. And prejudice generally refers to when an adjudicator has prejudged facts at issue in an adjudicative proceeding. Um, an extreme but clear example of bias would be if the respondent in a matter is the ex-spouse of a board member. Um, there may be bias <laughs> for or against in that situation, but certainly a personal relationship um, that, that would cause into question the, the ability of a board member to be impartial, right? Um, now, an example of prejudice, on the other hand, is when, for instance, a board member states publicly that they are convinced a respondent company violated the law before the matter has even gone to hearing. Um, again, that would indicate that that board member has drawn a conclusion without listening to all of the evidence and would in that instance establish some level of prejudice against the parties. Um, now, the existence of bias or prejudice occurs on a bit of a spectrum and often calls for a case-by-case -case assessment. So um, back to board member De La Torre's point, uh, the legal division is available to advise the board members um, when either matter is potentially at issue. Um, but the guiding principle should always be that a fair hearing requires an objective and open-minded decision maker. So with that, I'll move on to my final uh, sort of prohibition on the list of no-nos uh, and touch on today concerning um, what's considered an impermissible interest. And this relates primarily to financial conflicts that the adjudicator might have with one of the parties. Now, a common example here would be the, that of a board member who owns stock in a respondent company. A decision to significantly fine the company could have detrimental impact on the value of the board member's stock, and therefore they would have an impermissible interest in the outcome of the proceeding. Now, this prohibition exists not only under the APA, but as you've probably pieced together, also exists more generally as a conflict of interest prohibition, um, which is um, part of uh, sort of a separate body of law uh, enforced by the FPPC. So, but under sort of under both laws, the rule generally is really no financial interests in, in a company um, coming before this board and uh, with a decision that might impact that financial interest. Um, so with that, I, I tried to keep it short and sweet. That really does conclude my, my presentation on um, sort of rules of the road, so to speak, for board members going forward and also what enforcement process will look like um, going forward as well. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you very much, Mr. Laird. Um, questions or comments, Mr. Lay or Ms. De La Torre? All right. Um, that was very clear. Um, much appreciated. I think, as you said, helpful for the public um, as well. Uh, Mr. Sabo, um, are there any requests for public comment? For agenda item eight, if you'd like to make a comment on this item, please raise your hand at this time using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine if you're joining us by phone today. Again, this is for agenda item eight, overview of the enforcement process. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo, and no one has come forward here in Oakland. Um, so thanks very much again to Mr. Laird. Um, I'm gonna pause for just one um, moment to do a time check. Um, it's uh, 4.15, um, a little after 4.15. Um, we do have a few agenda items to get through, um, but I did want to check if, in case anybody needed a break.
Nope. You could use a five minute break. Um, all right. So let's take um, let's take a, a short break and come back at 425 p.m. And for everybody on the Zoom, as usual, we'll just leave it open and we'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, if um, if someone has a comment they'd like to make, they can always make it during the item for general public comment. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Welcome back, everyone. Um, let's move straight on to agenda item number nine, which is an enforcement update and priorities, uh, which will be presented by our new Deputy Director of Enforcement, Mr. Michael Macko. Welcome. We are delighted to have you. Um, and uh, please go ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon to the board and as well as to the public who are all joining us uh, both here and uh, via Zoom. Uh, let me make sure before I get started that the microphone is working uh, well. And thank you for the kind introduction as well. Um, so my name is Michael Macko. I joined the agency just a few months ago, as you mentioned in May, as uh, Deputy Director of Enforcement. Uh, as the board knows, uh, enforcement can begin as of uh, July 1st, subject only to a recent court decision that I'll address in just a moment. Uh, we're already hitting the ground running uh, to do what consumers expect of us, uh, to protect their privacy, and to ensure that covered businesses are complying with the law. I'd like to take the opportunity today to um, introduce myself, first, first and foremost, and, uh, and also to inform the board and, and the public uh, of the enforcement division's priorities um, for the coming year, the division's overall approach to enforcement, uh, and our plans for staffing, uh, which Mr. Sultani alluded to earlier today. I'll conclude by inviting the board to provide uh, feedback on our overall direction uh, and our allocation of resources, mindful of the separation that Mr. Laird uh, discussed a few moments ago between the agency's enforcement role on the one hand and the agency's adjudicatory role on the other hand. Uh, whenever I mention adjudicatory role, I'm, I'm referring to what Mr. Laird described where the, uh, the board has the function in deciding cases that are presented to it by the enforcement division. Uh, and the board acts in that capacity as a decision maker. Uh, before doing that, uh, I'll start with just some very brief background about who I am. Uh, I come from law enforcement, and that background informs the approach that I have and that I take uh, in terms of the matters that the enforcement division brings to the board for adjudication. It also informs um, the way in which the enforcement division engages with both the public um, as well as the regulated community. I've spent most of my 17 year legal career uh, in government enforcement at the federal level. Uh, for a decade, I served as an assistant US attorney uh, in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, one of the largest jurisdictions in the United States. Uh, my role there was to, um, to achieve justice, to bring justice. It wasn't to rack up wins or, or a number of cases. Uh, focusing on that just result uh, was a very important guiding principle for me, and I think for anybody who works in the Department of Justice, and it, it does shape and kind of color my approach to civil enforcement. Uh, as a federal prosecutor, I investigated and litigated cases involving fraud. That was one of my uh, specialties. 
uh, I focused on companies and individuals who flouted the rules uh, in different areas of the law, ranging from healthcare, uh, government contracts, financial regulation, uh, grant making, uh, just to name a few. I also enforced the uh, federal civil rights laws, things like the Americans with Disabilities Act, Fair Housing Act, um, as well as laws that uh, dealt with the federal response to the opioid crisis, like the uh, Controlled Substances Act, uh, as just one example. Uh, th these are all areas where I, I'm quite passionate. Uh, afterward, I served in the Enforcement Division of the US Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, where I handle insider trading cases, and other fraud cases under the securities laws in a similarly complex industry. The structure at the SEC is it's not unlike the structure here at the CPPA, where uh, there I brought matters before SEC commissioners who heard cases and decided cases from an enforcement division. So that, that structure is, is familiar. I've sat on both sides of the aisle um, before joining the agency. I served as in-house counsel where I managed uh, government-facing litigation and regulatory engagements worldwide. I, I worked in the tech industry, so I, these matters related generally to cloud computing, advertising, um, consumer protection, content moderation, data privacy, um, and, and overall financial regulation. I started my career uh, at a large law firm. Uh, I represented clients, both large and small, in that role. Uh, and I also clerked for judges in the district court uh, in the US Court of Appeals. So let, I would like to turn to the priorities for the enforcement division. And as we think about that, uh, I'd like to want, make one thing clear at the start uh, as it relates to the enforcement division's work. As the, the board knows, uh, a trial court uh, issued a decision over the July 4th holiday that affects enforcement of some of our regulations. And it's very important to place that decision in context, and I'd like to do that. Businesses do not have a free pass from all enforcement. There's no vacation here from enforcement. And, and why is that so? It's because nothing stops the enforcement division from enforcing the statute that the voters approved in 2020 the California Privacy Rights Act. Nothing stops the enforcement division uh, from enforcing the earlier statute that the CPRA amended. And nothing in that decision stops us from enforcing the earlier regulations or any of the regulations uh, more recently that were discretionary under our statute. As for those regulations though that were affected by the court's decision, uh, it's important to note that they're only one of our enforcement tools. We expect vigorous enforcement over the coming year, and by March of 2024, we would expect to see robust compliance with the entire set of regulations, given the nature of the trial court decision. We're nonetheless sensitive to the fact that or the potential impact of the court's decision uh, on businesses who might have designed their practices around the newer regulations, many of which sought to bring simplicity and, and harmony to compliance obligations. Uh, and some of those regulations uh, are on hold for enforcement purposes. The enforcement division will be considering any of those issues on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, but we wanted the board to know that we are uh, aware of those potential effects and, and, and sensitive to that. With that said, I'd like to turn to um, enforcement priorities and afterward invite feedback on the enforcement division's overall direction and the allocation of resources. As a new enforcement division, uh, we'd like to build public trust and confidence. Uh, at the same time, we'd like to show the uh, regulated community that we will enforce the privacy laws fairly and sensibly. And when we find violations, we will take aggressive action to protect the public. I think that's what the, the statute calls for. And as the board knows, some parts of the CPPA have been on uh, the books for years. Uh, others are newer, but for any part of the law that's been in effect for several years, businesses have been on notice of the requirements and the enforcement division expects them to be in full compliance. 
but, but that said, we do have discretion in determining uh, which cases we bring and when we bring them. So over the coming weeks and months, um, we'll be sketching out internally the, the specific areas where we think the public would benefit uh, the most from enforcement, and we'll be determining the proper order for addressing those, those cases. And we have a few guiding principles in mind as we set out to do that. First, any form of government enforcement, whether it's us or by, by, by any other agency, it requires the exercise of sound prosecutorial discretion. And this is a concept that's uh, very uh, familiar to me and comfortable to me, and, and I'd like to, to emphasize that. As we use that discretion, the Enforcement Division intends to prioritize matters that involve children, the elderly, any vulnerable or marginalized community or group that might be more susceptible to privacy violations or more susceptible to being overlooked. Second, the Enforcement Division intends to consider the overall circumstances of the case as we're deciding whether or not to use enforce the enforcement tool. Legal violations, as the board knows, that sometimes they can be black and white of the violation themselves. Um, but our decision to prosecute a violation as an enforcement division requires judgment. Um, and we would expect to consider things like the harm to consumers, the nature and the severity of that harm, the business's good faith efforts to comply with the law, and the business's size and resources, uh, among other things. I think all of these considerations can lead to a just result that I mentioned at the outset, which kind of informs my overall approach. These considerations, I should add, they're nothing new. Uh, they're, they're relevant to whether it's enforcement by us, whether it's enforcement by any other kind of enforcement agency. Uh, so we intend to consider, consider those factors and, and any other relevant factors as we're deciding uh, how to proceed to, to best protect the public. So with those considerations in mind, I'd like to turn to a few categories of potential enforcement that we expect will be priorities over the coming year. Uh, understanding that the board will be the adjudicator in any enforcement matter, I'll be describing a few of these priorities only at a, at a high level uh, and, and not in any particular order. So first, uh, a priority will relate to privacy notices and policies. The Enforcement Division expects to review privacy notices and policies to ensure compliance with the law's requirements. Notices to consumers are very much a gateway issue. Uh, they're not onerous. They're not, um, they, they've been part, they're not new. They've been part of California law uh, in their most basic form for many years. And they're explicit in, in the law. Uh, this isn't a question of, of legalese or paperwork. This is, it's, it's foundational and it's um, a question of business function. So. The enforcement division intends to review whether businesses are collecting and using data in a way that they disclosed to consumers. In other words, are businesses doing what they say? A second priority area will relate to the right to delete. Uh, as we all know, uh, California law protects consumer privacy in, in a lot of different ways, uh, including by giving consumers the right to request that businesses delete their personal information. The right to deletion, it's well established. It, it's even older uh, than the right to request correction, for example. So the enforcement division expects to review whether and how businesses are employ, uh, are uh, complying with that, with that longstanding right that we have in our law. And a third priority that uh, for the enforcement division will deal with the implementation of consumer requests. This priority also focuses on business practices. Uh, the Enforcement Division expects to review how businesses, in fact, are implementing consumer requests that they receive. So in other words, when consumers make a request under the CCPA, such as a request to opt out of sale, for example, what are businesses doing specifically in response? How are businesses actually operationalizing the law's requirements. What barriers, if any, are 
business is introducing to prevent consumers from exercising their rights? Uh, these are important questions for us. Uh, businesses need to do more than pay lip service to the law's requirements. And so this priority uh, will address that and attempt to, to get at that. The enforcement division's priorities will be evolving uh, and they're not limited to these broad areas that I just outlined. We will constantly reevaluate our priorities as we're learning more information from consumers and from the industry. The enforcement division fully expects that to pursue investigations that involve aspects of the law that I haven't mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's very likely. The next logical question is how we um, plan to tackle these priorities. And I'll start with staffing that, that we had uh, discussed earlier today. Currently, we are hiring up to three enforcement attorneys at the attorney four level. Recruitment's uh, already underway and we are reviewing applications. We are also hiring an enforcement attorney at the attorney three or, or one level, depending on the, the candidate's experience. Recruitment is likewise uh, underway for that role. In the coming months, we expect to advertise the position of assistant chief counsel for enforcement, as well as an additional uh, attorney position. We also expect to bring on a senior legal analyst and a staff services manager, all as, as part of our build out of the enforcement division's capabilities, uh, including handling of consumer complaints. So this team uh, working together is going to build the infrastructure that we need to have a, a robust uh, a robust enforcement program. I'm very happy to be a part of that from the start. And while we work to build out that team, I should mention that we're not waiting to begin enforcement. The enforcement division will be using our existing resources to build a foundation for bringing these cases in a way that is consistent with the agency's separation of functions that we have discussed. So I'll now give the board an opportunity to provide um, feedback on what I've described as our priorities and our overall direction, uh, mindful of the uh, board's potential role as an adjudicator down the road. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to introduce myself today and to share these priorities uh, with all of you and with the public. Uh, and we look forward within the enforcement division to presenting these matters to the board in a clear and fair way in the years to come. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Macko. Um, I really, um... I'm grateful that you've joined the agency. It's clear that you bring a wealth of relevant experience uh, that will um, uh, that will um, help build out our enforcement function um, very significantly. So thank you um, very much um, just for you know for being here and for joining us. Um, uh, I would like to open it up to um, my fellow board members for any questions or comments. I just have a quick comment about the court decision that you mentioned. Um, before we start, I'm you know I'm pleased that the court was clear that significant portions of Proposition 24 privacy protections were enforceable um, starting July 1st. Um, it is disappointing that the enforcement of some portions of the regulations is delayed until March of next year. But for myself, I just wanted to state that I fully support um, the agency in its work to enforce the law um, outside of what is covered. Um, by the delay um, on behalf of Californians and, and look forward um, and look forward to that work. Um, with that, I'd like to ask if there are, if other board members have um, questions or comments. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to echo the chair and um, all, all of those comments, really. Um, and, you know, thank you for your introduction and, and sharing your priorities. Um, you know, excited to have you on. And, um, you know, I thought that was a strong statement of, you know, what the agency is going to pursue and a clear notice to, um, you know, businesses throughout California that, you know, this isn't a vacation, uh, that we will have enforcement of um, yeah, what, what they should have notice of. So um, thank you for that. And I think in terms of, um, one thing I wanted to, you know, for, for the enforcement division to keep in mind is, um, you know, while there is a firewall between um, at many times the board and the enforcement division and legal division, um, what would be helpful is to, as, as enforcement happens, is to think through how 
we can relay to the board and the, and the agency, you know, fully about how, as we draft our regulations, what makes it easier for enforcement to do their job, right? How do we design uh, our regulations in ways that make it easier for businesses to comply and for us to uncover um, violations? So, um, you know, just trying to be efficient with making your job easier and making, um, yeah, compliance easier as well. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Ms. Elatori? Thank you. I uh, also uh, fully support this statement um, that um, was provided by the chair in terms of uh, enforcement. I, I want to welcome you to the agency. I'm very glad that uh, we have uh, been able to attract the talent that you bring to the agency. Um, in terms of the um, presentation, I do have a couple of um, comments that I wanted to share. I understand that there has to be a division between enforcement and, and legal and, and, and the board, but as we mature and, and you um, grow your staff, um, I think it will be beneficial to think about how other similar agencies think about priorities for enforcement. And I you know, support that you came here with ideas, all of them seem strong ideas, but I think every year, maybe we should have a conversation on how you're thinking about just priorities in general um, so that you can get the feedback from the board. Unfortunately, our resources are limited and you're gonna have to make some tough choices in terms of some cases that might not, um, you, we might not be able to.
Okay, wonderful. Could you let us know when it, do you know when it cut out? Does Ms. De La Torre? It was, I think, um, halfway through, I had to guess. Um, halfway through Ms. De La Torre's remarks. I can quickly summarize them and then that should be. Um, so I just um, generally supported the um, comments from um, the chair, uh, from uh, Member Lay. I um, welcome. Uh, Mr. Macklin to the agency. Um, and I had a, a, a few um, I, a ideas that I wanted to share around how to, as we mature as an agency, think about priorities for enforcement and the participation of the board in getting an understanding and um, of those priorities and, and also shaping those priorities. Um, I appreciate the fact that um, we have been presented with very sound initial priorities to have, but in the future, starting um, you know, when is that resources permitted, uh, it will be helpful to have a presentation from the enforcement division that outlines what are going to be the um, priorities for the next 12 months in a written form and uh, have the opportunity to have a conversation at the board level. And the one thing that I mentioned specifically um, in terms of um, vulnerable um, communities, which I fully support um, the protection of the communities that were uh, mentioned by our deputy director. Um, and the one that came to mind to me that was not maybe specifically mentioned, although I'm sure that it was, you know, considered um, uh, is the um, reproductive rights and uh, how we can, to the extent that we can uh, protect uh, residents perhaps of other states that seek uh, services in California that they, um, that they need to um, um, ensure their well-being and the well-being of their families. Um, other than that, I think that's that. That, that that's what I remember. <laughs> right, I'm okay. impressed. Perfect. <laughs> I don't think I would have been able to recreate what I said so effectively. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Thank you. With regards to the comment about um, enforcement priorities, we do have an enforcement um, annual priorities discussion on our annual calendar. Um, it's currently set for September. Um, we got a little bit of a preview, I think, since we're welcoming Mr. Macko and um, starting enforcement, um, but that is something that is uh, regularized um, on the calendar, and I'm sure he'll advise us as to whether that is the right timing and, and so forth. Um, so I appreciate um, that very much. Um, with regards to vulnerable um, communities, I would also, just like um, Mr. Macko, if you would consider Obviously, this requires resources um, uh, to uh, also consider language barriers um, and possibly having some language skill um, on staff or via contract. I mean, that's difficult with enforcement. But in any case, thinking through the fact that um, communities, different language communities um, are likely to be targeted differently, affected differently, and to the, you know, as, so we can enforce on behalf of all California, um, I, I would just like to um, mention that um, it's probably already on your radar, um, but I wanted to bring that up as well. Um, Mr. Lay? Yeah, um, I, I was going to save this perhaps for September, uh, but, you know, while we're, while we're mentioning our our, uh, our wish lists, um, you know, to to the extent possible, right, as, as resources allow, I think, you know, as resources and timing um, allow uh, just taking action on uh, when you said what, what impact, right, you want to think big impact, you know, I think, um, reducing friction for consumers that want to exercise their rights, um, uh, whether that's in terms of how they access, you know, their opt-out rights or, um, you know, what the data minimization requirements uh, that that businesses should have to be aware of. Um, you know, I think those things minimize the need for consumers to have to um, yeah, go through burdensome processes to protect their data, and I think sending a strong signal uh, in through our enforcement would be would be a helpful way to let businesses know that you know 
and consumers, right? That, you know, California's rights are beginning to come into effect, uh, are coming into effect, have come into effect, um, and letting them notice, right? When they, when they go on the internet that, um, yeah, they don't have to click through so many things to, to exercise their rights. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Yes, I would also just like to say that I fully support the, um, the thinking to focus on where mechanisms aren't working for consumers. I'm not exactly sure how you described it, but what is the response that they get? Is it meaningful? You know, does it comply with the law? Of course, I think that um, is an important priority. Other comments or questions? Right, Mr. Sultani? Just a quick logistical one about um, the agenda item. Um, as you mentioned, Chair, it's, we typically have, or on our regularized calendar, we set this agenda item for September regularly, mm -hmm. but we thought to move it up this year because it's the first you know, month, you know, we, we begin enforcement in July, so it seemed appropriate. We can certainly do another one at our next board meeting if the board prefer, or we anticipated doing the following one, the following September, or even sooner if we find the timing is better. But I, um, any direction on whether you all prefer to have this repeated in, you know, basically in two months or to wait. And I, I defer to the chair. Uh, okay, know. thank you. Um, if um, if Mr. Lay or Ms. De La Torre have um, of thoughts on that, I'd be happy to take them. Um, my view would be, so there are some pros and cons. Um, uh, We've been, I think, well briefed um, in this session. So I would, um, for purposes of the three of us, you know, I would suggest that maybe it's bef maybe we have a, sort of a catch up before the next yearly um, priorities. Um, but we, I would be happy to leave that up to the discretion of Mr. Mackle and the Enforcement Division, and you know whether or not they think that that would be helpful and something that we need. I am, a, I am um, a, a attentive to the fact that we are just the three of us. Um, and so um, to the extent that it would be helpful um, to have an item on the agenda before that, whether it's September or maybe November or something like that, um, I would also like staff to consider that. But again, I would be very happy to leave that up to staff's discretion. Um, that is my initial reaction, um, but I would like to ask if there are feedback from Mr. Lay or Ms. De La Torre. Yeah, um, I think maybe, yeah, you know, I, I just said my piece right now, um, but perhaps one before March um, could, could be helpful. Uh, it doesn't have to be September or November, but yeah, before March. That, that makes sense to me. I think that on a regular schedule, it should be once yearly and before the year starts. So I think it was, you know, calendar right, but uh, given that we got a preview, um, if that has to be delayed or it makes sense to delay it until the beginning of next year, um, to the extent possible, if we could anticipate, although we cannot really anticipate, but ideally this conversation could be had with uh, five board members, um, that would be what we should attempt to achieve um, if, if that causes a little bit of a delay that um, that, that I, uh, I I think that is fine. So I basically support um, what the chair just mentioned of giving flexibility to staff, considering uh, or prioritizing um, the um, ability of the board to hear this again sometime before the end of next year, ideally with uh, five board members present. Thank you for that feedback uh, and for all the feedback uh, that you provided, and we will I'll get back to you with a, a proposed agenda item to, to address that concern. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Mackle. We'll look forward to seeing you when we see you. Um, and with that, I would ask if there is any public comment on this item. Yes, Madam Chair, we have Megan Gray. Megan, I'm going to unmute you in just a moment, and you will have three minutes to make your public comment. Hi, everyone. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Hi, y'all are doing great work. Thank you so much for all the time you've put in. I just wanted to make a, a quick comment. I know that y'all can't respond to this. I'm not anticipating a response. I just wanted to get this on your radar. The uh, presentation about enforcement was very helpful. I think it would be even more helpful to have more granular information about some components of that. There was a line item about the uh, statutory administrative fine 
but I did not see anything about injunctive relief. As I think we're all familiar, the ultimate goal here is behavior change. And that's going to revolve largely around your ability to force your will on a potentially recalcitrant uh, company. So I'd be interested to hear more about the injunctive path. And I'm also interested to learn more about how you calculate violations. The administrative fine is determined on how you, one, determine what is a violation, and then you have to count it. There is ambiguity at the federal level on how you count violations. It's not as intuitive as one might expect. And so I would also be interested at some point if you could expand on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Megan Gray. Are there additional public comments? Oops. So at this time, if you'd like to make a public comment, please go ahead and raise your hand. This is for agenda item number nine, enforcement update and priorities. You can raise your hand using Zoom's raised hand feature or by pressing star nine if you're calling in by phone. Again, this is for agenda item nine, enforcement update and priorities. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any further hands. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Um, thank you to the board members and thank you very much, Mr. Macko. Again, welcome. Uh, we will be seeing you when we see you. Um, and with that, um, let's move to agenda item number 10. Uh, the topic is a delegation of authority to conduct probable cause hearings. I think we have a theme going. Um, uh, Philip Laird, our general counsel will present that. Thank you, Mr. Laird, please go ahead. Thank you and hello again. I will try to keep this quick. In connection with this item, there is publicly available memorandum that was included to explain generally the purpose and benefit of explicitly delegating authority to agency staff the ability to hear and conduct probable cause proceedings. As the board is aware, this probable cause proceeding is fairly unique to our agency and modeled after the FPPC. Accordingly, we propose to follow the same process that the FPPC does, whereby the general counsel and or the legal division, as delegated by the executive director, will conduct the probable cause proceedings and make a finding of probable cause. Um, because the legal division is strictly walled off from the enforcement division, we'll, we will be able to carry out this role without creating any sort of conflict. And so um, with that, unless there are questions from the board, staff is recommending at this time that the board make the delegation that was included in the public materials. Um, I'm happy to read that aloud if that's helpful, um, but otherwise that is that is staff's recommendation for this item. Thank you, Mr. Laird. Uh, just as a clarification, the, the draft delegation that we have in our materials for today um, delegates to the executive director, as you mentioned. It's going to have to take a jog, right, because of the separation between the legal division and enforcement or just for practical purposes. Um, and the reason we're delegating to the executive director who could then further delegate is because the statute gives us the ability as the board to delegate to the chairperson or the executive director, correct? That's correct. I just want to be sure I had the path um, uh, correct. And, and interestingly, it is the same path that FPPC's delegation even yes. takes. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Questions or comments from the board? No. no. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, in that case, um, I will propose that we have a motion um, to pursuant to Civil Code Section 1798.199.35 that we delegate to the agency's executive director the authority to hear and decide or further delegate probable cause proceedings pursuant to Civil Code Section 1798.199.55 and Title 11 of the California Code of Regulations, Division 6, Chapter 1, Section 7302, consistent with requirements of the Administrative Procedures Act. In order to ensure that probable cause proceedings are fair and impartial, the Executive Director may further delegate the authority to hear and decide probable cause hearings to the General Counsel or to an attorney from the agency's legal division. May I have that motion? I so move. Thank you, Mr. Lay. May I have a second? I second. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. 
Uh, we have a motion on the table. Um, may I ask for public comment? This is for, for agenda item 10, delegation of authority to conduct probable cause hearings. If you'd like to speak on this item at this time, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand function or press star nine if you're joining by phone. Again, this is for agenda item 10, delegation of authority to conduct probable cause hearings. This is the final call for public comment on this item. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any further hands. Thank you, Mr. Sabo. Um, in that case, I will ask um, you um, to please conduct a roll call vote on whether to adopt the motion as stated. Okay, board member De La Torre? Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board member Lay? Aye. Lay, aye. Board member McTaggart? Chair Urban? Aye. Urban, aye. Madam Chair, you have three ayes. Thank you very much. With that, the motion passes with a vote of three to zero. And I will ask that um, executive director and staff implement the delegation um, as uh, as given to you. <laughs> Sorry, it's getting a little bit late in the day. <laughs> um, uh, so let's move on to um, agenda item number 11, which is a delegation of authority for hiring of a chief privacy auditor. Um, that is a position that is mentioned in our statute. Um, and if uh, you'd like to, please turn your attention to the materials. There's a short memo um, on this item recommending that the board delegate authority to hire the chief privacy auditor um, and again, the proposed delegation. Uh, this will also be presented by Mr. Laird. Um, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Urban. I'll keep this one even shorter. Um, there is, as the chair mentioned, a publicly available memorandum that I think is pretty self-explanatory. So in short, staff is recommending that the board delegate authority to the executive director to hire the chief privacy auditor with the option, should the board choose, to present the successful candidate for the board concurrence, um, which is very similar to what was done with my position. So if you'll see um, in the materials, um, the, uh, the proposed delegation has As an end uh, at the end board for concurrence in the hiring. Um, that is in brackets because um, depending on the nature of the delegation the board wishes to make, um, if you'd like to exercise that option, we can include that. If you'd like to just make the delegation outright, we would omit that. Thank you very much, Mr. Laird. Um, I think this makes uh, a lot of sense. Um, we've we've we were very happy to do the work to hire our executive director. <laughs> Um, but having the um, expertise of, of staff um, for this hire in particular, I think would be very beneficial. Um, uh, comments, uh, questions from Mr. Lay and Ms. De La Torre. And if you have uh, an opinion on the bracketed language, please do mention that. I've, I've managed to misplace the exhibit A. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I can I can go first while, while you read that. Um, I think uh, I I tend to think the that the staff has uh, done a good job. The executive 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 director has done a good job in in making our hires, um, and you know considering how how these board meetings are getting more and more packed, uh, I would I would tend to just delegate without needing to provide that concurrence. But I guess I would, before I do that, uh, like a little bit more information on how the executive director envisions the role of the chief privacy auditor at this stage. That's a great question. Thank you for that opportunity. Um, the, as, I, as I laid out in the um, budget presentation, um, you know, I, I think the agency is unique in that we have authority to audit businesses' compliance with the statute. And um, we have a separate enforcement division that will fundamentally enforce the law, but I see the chief um, auditor as um, both informing or referring to enforcement um, businesses compliance, uh, as well as conducting independent research and uh, recommendations to inform the agency generally about our rulemaking, about compliance, et cetera. Um, I, I think if I had to, uh, you know, the closest corollary would be my previous position as the FTC as the chief technologist. So it would be essentially building up the resources uh, in, within the agency to monitor and observe and audit compliance with the law. I imagine um, once 
uh, for example, when the DPIAs, the risk assessments are completed or cybersecurity audits, um, they could flow to both enforcement or initially through uh, the chief auditor and their staff. And so in the org chart, the chief auditor is uh, kind of separate from enforcement, and they have two ITS3s, for lack of a better classification, two other technologists under him or her, uh, and they will um, effectively help uh, both inform the agency's practices with regards to rulemaking, observe businesses' practices and perform audits, as well as make referrals to enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. Oh, uh, thank you. So um, this um, position, the chief privacy auditor position, is a role that we have considered at the board and level for a while. Basically, since since the beginning, we thought about it as a one of the initial hires potentially. I um, understand that the hire was delayed, and at this point, because of the requirement to meet in person, it will be, you know, getting, um, it, it's difficult to think about how the, the, the board could get involved without delaying um, the process. Um, so I'm happy to delegate to the executive director. Um, that said, I, I thought it was helpful to have an opportunity to concur in the appointment of um, the general counsel, and I will very much appreciate if we could also do the same with um, the executive director. Um, I think it gives us an opportunity to um, learn more about um, the person that has been chosen. It also gives us an, an opportunity to um, support that hire um, right from the start, and it's an important hire. Um, because we now have a regular schedule where we meet uh, twice a month, it shouldn't uh, cause delays in the hiring process uh, because you could expect that you know in whichever meeting the um, the selection is ready, we could just quickly have a conversation about it, learn more about it, and then um, express our support for the candidate that is chosen. So my preference will be to um, leave that um, uh, option to um, concur on the selection of the candidate if the other board members um, uh, support that. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, Mr. Lay expressed the, um, the practical, efficient, and priority um, point of how many items we need to be considering in board meetings um, uh, at, at the moment and for the foreseeable future. Uh, so I wanted to give you, Mr. Lay, an opportunity to give us the Sure of you, yeah. Of your opinion. If we made a hire, wanted to submit an offer, like in between those, it might require that candidate to wait a month, and we may lose that candidate. Is my concern, um, and I. So I, I do think it is. It is going to slow. Might slow things down. Maybe perhaps there is another way we can get board information. Maybe just through email uh, separately. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there's a, any alternative like midway positions between this that wouldn't require us to time the hire with, you know, a, a bi-monthly board meeting. So um, yeah, that's that's my main concern around the, the bracketed language. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Mr. Sultani? Yeah, I can respond to that. And I fully recognize this is an important functional role. Um, I think we could certainly work around whatever the contours the, the board prefers. Um, Mr. Lee, you are right that we we one of the challenges in the process that we've identified for um, Mr. Laird and for uh, for uh, Ms. White is that we can't actually extend a formal offer to a candidate um, until the board concurs because of the the potential for the board to um, take a different position, um, and so therefore you know there could be up to you know however many a month or two. Where we have a key candidate, and we can't, you know, we effectively um, aren't able to uh, extend an offer formally. And so, if they're willing to wait, and maybe they are, um, we can get them. Uh, I'll leave it to Mr. Laird to answer if there's any other way. Sorry, to put you on the spot. Uh, Board Member Lay, I've been racking my brain to think through a creative way I could uh, do exactly kind of what you were suggesting. Unfortunately, it would be difficult. I think uh, there wouldn't really be a way for us to solicit board consensus. 
uh, outside of a board meeting on, on could, that. So, could I offer a suggestion? I, well, this is I, on the fly, so I'm warning you now. Um, would it be possible to delegate the authority with the expectation that if a board meeting is timed such that it doesn't delay an offer and staff's opinion and discretion in a way that would cause detriment to the agency or the hire, um, then the board would be given information and be able to concur. Absolutely. That we could accommodate. <laughs> so I um, I see this a little different. I think the um, role is really a key role for us. And if a candidate is not willing to wait for a few weeks, it might not be the ideal candidate uh, for the role, to be honest. And the interviews have to be timed. They can be timed in a way that it um, aligns with the calendar that we now can predict for the foreseeable future. Um, that said, I, I do hear the concerns that have been raised and I wouldn't wanna create a situation where um, you know, we we miss out in the, uh, on a great candidate because there's um, circumstances that we cannot anticipate. Um, the one suggestion that I will offer is to go with um, something similar to what um, the chairman um, mentioned with the caveat that if um, the there's a the need to extend that offer uh, that doesn't align with a board meeting, perhaps that could come to subcommittee, um, perhaps the process subcommittee, just to avoid that um, that potential difficulty. And I just want to pause here because this is on the fly as well. So um, I want to check with Mr. Lear. Will that be possible? Uh, can you restate it just to make sure I understand it clearly? Right. What the so to leave this um, um, uh, additional um, opportunity for the um, board to concur uh, with the caveat that if it was to cause any um, mm. dispension, that um, the staff will have an opportunity to bring it to the subcommittee so that a, a, an offer can be extended um, before uh, a meeting of the board take place. Would that be a possibility? Um, so I, I suppose the key there would be if there's still for full board concurrence required at the end of that. Um, I, you the see what subcommittee I'm... would not be able to concur itself because the subcommittee doesn't have any decision making mm -hmm. authority. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be informing to board members, I guess, at a higher level. I think um, if so, first of all, um, in response to Mr. Latore, um, I absolutely agree this is an important position for the agency, and I think that's a really important point. Um, I am balancing it against the fact that there, and I, and I also um, take your point that we need to have the right person, um, and there are indications of who's the right person, one of which is will they you know, take the job on the schedule that we can offer it. Um, I think those are both very um, important points to keep in mind. I'm also cognizant of having um, done some of the state hiring work um, before the staff blessedly <laughs> um, took it away from me, that there can be so many things that are unpredictable that are just in the sort of the hiring processes and CalHR's processes in the state um, that I would probably come down on the side of if we are able to articulate um, anything to Mr. Soltani that we want to be sure um, is encompassed in this role um, to then go ahead and, and um, uh, um, delegate it fully. Um, at the same time, I, I don't feel terribly strongly about this. I guess what I'm saying is I really see the value in both Ms. De La Torre's and Mr. Lay's useful interventions, um, which is why I suggested that kind of middle ground. Um, and I wonder, I think there are complications with the subcommittee idea, and I'm not sure that it would fulfill the goals of having board input. Of course, if there were something 
that um, indicate that, that that came up so that the hire had to happen outside of a board meeting, of course, then we would be giving up input um, fully. But if staff thinks that um, the sort of middle way um, where so long as it's reasonably connected to a board meeting, the board um, has been put uh, via concurrence, um, I would be comfortable with that. I don't know. I just want, I don't know if that goes far enough for you, Ms. De La Troy. And also, I don't know. I mean, Mr. Lee made the point that it isn't just that we have a meeting in place. It's also that our meetings are really packed. So it's, you know, 520 on a Friday. And I really appreciate everybody's um, work and sticking around. But everything we add is, is, is more, um, more board meeting time. So we're valuing, you know, our own resources, basically. Yeah, I'm less concerned about the meeting time uh, piece because I don't think it will take too much time. And I think it's important enough to dedicate perhaps 30 minutes to it. But I um, I value the um, concern of Mr. Lay. So maybe something um, similar to what the chair described can address both uh, concerns. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I mean, if, if the, the subcommittee idea doesn't work, then it doesn't work, but I, I would be okay with that. Um, but it doesn't sound like the general counsel believes that that is a valid way to, to do this. Uh, it, I, it, to the chair's point, um, if there's a prohibition essentially through Bagley Keen, unless the, <laughs> the subcommittee wanted to um, uh, consider this all in public session, which makes it a little bit more complicated. Um, not allowing us to delegate that full authority. And then plus, if the idea was that the subcommittee was still to present the board for concurrence, and I think we haven't actually uh, resolved the issue. We've just sort of created a no intermediary layer. step. Okay. Um, well, one other thing I just thought I'd mention, which I know none of us like to entertain, we'd ever have to go this path, but um, you know, the position of this position would be an exempt position, which means under state service, it's actually an at-will position, unlike other civil service positions that receive some protections. The point being, um, there would be an avenue if the board were dissatisfied with the hire that the board could um, convene during a meeting and give a direction to the executive director about their dissatisfaction with the hire. But, but that's, I mean, that's the opposite of the of the objective here. Yeah. The objective is really to express the support of the board for for the hire. So I will very much want to not be in <laughs> yeah. that in that position, and I don't Absolutely. think we we would be. Um, so, and I guess the, so there's no like two-way delegation like we did with the, um, you know, delegate to the chair who also delegates it to the chair and the <laughs> subcommittee. Okay. All right. We, um, I mean, yeah, I, I think the, the alternative model is, you know, if, if maybe the hire is within two weeks of a board meeting, right. Then just wait, make, sorry, the hire has to wait the extra two weeks, um, that could be good, but I, I think waiting a month and a half in limbo, whether or not you can get a job offer, uh, may be a little bit difficult. Um, so I, that's kind of maybe the, the balance that we could do. Um, um, how about the idea of, um, in the case of, uh, emergency, I, I just, it's difficult for me to imagine that somebody cannot wait for a month or a, a final but offer. I mean, that's, yeah. that's not what I'm experiencing, yeah, yeah. but, but I, 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 I want to make sure that we address everybody's concerns. So if, if it cannot be delegated to a subcommittee, could we delegate it to the chair? Like if there's a situation where um, it's just not feasible to bring it to the full board, could we just uh, make sure that at least uh, the hire gets the uh, uh, concurrence of the chair? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll let Phil answer that, but just, um, I think the, Again, I have no. Uh, I, I I fully recognize that that if this is uh, the outcome, I have no not a strong preference. I just want to clarify that we would ultimately, and we might need Vaughn for this, but I think you we we're essentially saying, and we did it with Phil and and, and Mr. Laird and, and Ms. White, but um, that the board would be ultimately be the from a from a hiring HR process, the board would be fi the final. Um, essentially. No, I don't think so. We worked okay. all of this out when we worked out the delegation. Sorry to interrupt. I yeah. just figured for efficiency's yeah. sake. When we worked out the delegation um, for your delegation in which we carved out the concurrence. The yeah. But, um, guess... but that was not actually a limit on your ability to hire. It was that the board would give, I think, Mr. Thompson's term 
um, coming from Congress was like advice and consent. Um, and so I don't know that it, it wouldn't be a board hire, I don't think. I think that's right. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to clarify is through, from what I understand of Cal HR rules, and Juan can clarify, but in the adverse situation, if the board were not satisfied for the, with the candidate that the staff and the review panel had scored and gone through the Cal HR process, then there would need to be a kind of uh, justification for why that um, candidate was not chosen. And so we would essentially have to, uh, and I don't think this was going to happen. I'm just giving you guys the contours that in closed session, you guys would essentially be the final review panel and you would need to, we would need to have you document um, that just so that there is a reason why the highest scoring candidate from the prior interview panels was not chosen. So that's just that's just one procedural piece, but I think we can overcome that by making sure that in that concurrence process, if there is an adverse decision or if there's a decision not to select that um, recommended candidate or the, the candidate that staff put forward, that you all are in a position to document and clarify the reason that so that it comports with Cal HR rules because we have to basically submit to an audit every two years of how our hiring processes are fair and equitable. And they're usually based on the scoring criteria of the desired qualifications and the desirable qualifications, et cetera. So that's a long-winded way of saying, I think we can do it um, however uh, the, the board um, see fit, but I do wanna just flag that closed session concurrence piece doesn't exactly comport with Cal HR. So we would instead set it up as essentially a final interview panel. I understand, okay. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for that clarification. Um, all right, so uh, I think we have a few options on the table. Um, one of course is either version of what's on the paper. Um, one is to um, delegate the authority. Um, and if the, um, if the hire would be within two weeks, or we could tweak it <laughs> of a board meeting um, that the board could concur. Um, one would be that um, there's a delegation to the executive director and also a delegation from the board to concur with the executive directors, sorry, the delegation from the board to the chair um, to concur with the executive director's decision if I understand the structure mm -hmm. of Ms. Delatory. Okay, um, so I think those are the, I think those are the, um, options that we have i think the second option will meet all of the requirements we don't need to put a like a two week or yeah. just leave it flexible but enable the uh, staff to make a determination if the delay is going to cause an issue with the hire and it is uh, it's relevant there is a venue to um, kind of have yeah. that conversation with the chair okay um mr Laird, does yeah. that work for you okay. all right um mr laird um if you can help me with this one um Here's my suggestion on the fly. Um, a motion pursuant to civil code section 1798.199.135. And I won't read all of this because I'll do the final motion after you tell me if it works or not. Um, delegate to the agency's executive authority, the authority to act, it's executive director, excuse me, the authority to act on the boards. They have to conduct and oversee the hiring of the agency's chief privacy auditor, provided that um, if a hire could be accomplished within a reasonable, a reasonable gonna... proximity to a board meeting um, in staff's discretion, um, then the uh, selected candidate shall be presented to the board for concurrence in the hiring. Oh, no, I, think I, I have a different suggestion that oh. might, might simplify it. So we could approve this delegation as is and then have a separate delegation to the chair to act as the board yeah. in terms of the concurrent for the hiring if, if it's. Yeah, so I think just instead of with the bracketed language, perhaps just changing presented to the chair. Oh, okay, I, I'm sorry, I missed, I think I miscounted the options. So I <laughs> so, thought, sorry, I, I, like um, maybe we need um, assistance of the general counsel, but I was thinking we could approve this as is with the language in brackets and then have a separate delegation to the chair to be able to act on behalf of the board in the concur for this hire for other hires if the delay to bring it to the, to the oh, board. Oh, I see you've combined. You it, you know, okay. Moving forward for any other hire. Okay, that, that's fine with me. Does that work, Mr. Laird? Yeah. For when we say for any other hire, 
How do we I mean? Don't think there is any other. No. Well, I, I I would say we couldn't expand it beyond the chief privacy auditor based on today's agenda item is my yeah. only concern. But I I think we can do for this position exactly what you're saying. Okay. So let me let me make sure I understand. So can we not fully delegate on the chair moving forward the ability to speak for the board in any concur? Because it seems to be easier. I, I agree. It would be easier. We just. Um, it's not quite the nature of this agenda item because that would be oh, for other it. employment items. So got I think we it have to leave be. it to the okay. chief privacy Perfect. auditor. So, okay, I think I understand now. So we've combined actually what I thought were two options. So um, first delegate to the executive director and then secondly, delegate to the chair, the ability to, the ability to concur with the executive director if there isn't approximate board meeting. Mm -hmm. I, I do, yeah, I think we could almost do it as a single motion with the bracketed language and a sort of, but if <laughs> there is an approximate board meeting. How about the can, with the exception that, or provided that the selected candidate shall be presented to the board for concurrence in the hiring if um, in the chairperson's judgment, there's a reasonably proximate board meeting or something. Can we Can we kind of flip the the signs a little bit that's fine with me yeah um and do we need to do we need to use the word delegation uh, um well it, i suppose it depends um if if you would like the chair to just serve as sort of the gatekeeper of this then we wouldn't actually even be delegating the concurrence necessarily unless you want to um I think there's a, you know, I, I know we're <laughs> we're probably overcomplicating this, right? Um, I'm not sure about two motions because if we've delegated full authority, then we're delegating. I don't know. Uh, why don't we just do the bracketed but and then but if? Yeah. Um, or, or I was going to say. Uh, the bracketed, um, presented to the board for concurrence in the hiring, comma, or in the event a board meeting is not proximate to the hiring to the chair for concurrence. Okay. Yeah, yeah I think that, yeah. well, Mr. Laird, to tell us that's legally. Yes, that I believe we could do. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. So I'm going to formulate this and feel free to tell me I got it wrong. Um, uh, may I have a motion pursuant to civil codes section 1798.199.35 and 1798.199.40 subdivision F, the California Privacy Protection, that the California Privacy Protection Agency Board delegates to the agency's executive director the authority to act on the board's behalf to conduct and oversee the hiring of the agency's chief privacy auditor, with the exception that the selected candidate shall be presented to the board for concurrence in the hiring unless the chair determines there is not a reasonably approximate board meeting in which case concurrence shall rest with the chair. Shoot, I messed it up. <laughs> I, 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 I love that. I okay. That is advice. <laughs> All right, may I have that motion? I motion. Thank I'll you. I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Lay, for the second. Um, uh, is there public comment on this item? This is for agenda item 11, delegation of authority for hiring of a chief privacy officer. If you'd like to make a comment on this item at this time, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand function or press star nine if you're joining by phone. And this is for agenda item 11. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand. I'm not seeing any hands at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Thanks everybody. Uh, Mr. Sabo, in that case, um, will you please perform a roll call vote on whether the board agrees to adopt the motion as stated? Yes, board member De La Torre. Aye. Board member Lay? Aye. Lay, aye. McTaggart? Chair Urban? Aye. Urban, aye. Madam Chair, you have three ayes. 
Thank you very much. The motion carries with a vote of three to zero. Thank you very much to um, both other members of the board um, and to staff. And I'll just, um, in case the subordinate subordinate clause kicks in, um, I will follow what I understand from the discussion today in, in terms of exercising my discretion. So thank you much. Uh, thank you very much for the thoughtful consideration of that issue. Um, with that, we will move to item number 12. This is our item for public comment on items not on the agenda. As mentioned at the top of the meeting, um, this provides an opportunity for public comment on items that we haven't covered on the agenda. As a reminder, we do welcome public comment today, but before we proceed, please recall that the only action we can take in response to um, comments is to listen and to consider where we, whether we might discuss the topic at a future board meeting. We cannot take any other action on uh, such an item at this meeting. Um, it may seem as though we're being unresponsive, um, but this is very important to ensure that the rules of the Open Meeting Act are followed to avoid compromising either the commenter's goals or the board's um, goals or mission. Um, so with that statement, um, I'd like to open it up for public comment on items not on the agenda. And Mr. Sabo, please let me know if anyone would like to comment via Zoom. Sure, this is for agenda item number 12, public comment on items not on the agenda. If you'd like to speak on this agenda item, please raise your hand at this time using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine if you're joining us by phone. Again, this is for agenda item 12, public comment on items not on the agenda. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. With that, we'll move to agenda item number 13, which is the item for future agenda items. Uh, under this item, uh, we can bring up and the public can bring up items to be considered for future agendas, um, although we cannot discuss those items themselves. Um, as a reminder, um, We'll, keep, uh, we'll be keeping a list of items to be considered in addition to the standing items we already have on our annual agenda. The calendar is available um, for reference in the materials from our May 14, 2023 meeting on our website um, to preview um, for my fellow board members um, benefits. Um, in our next meeting, which is in September, the annualized topics are the enforcement report and priorities that we talked about and we've discussed um, uh, what to do with that, um, renewing the executive director's delegation of authority and an annual hiring update, including diversity and inclusion metrics. In addition, I have on my running list um, strategic planning, as I mentioned in my update earlier today. Um, uh, Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay are likely to have a CPRA, a new CPRA rules subcommittee um, item um, for that uh, coming up soon. Um, Ms. De La Torre and I will have a rulemaking process subcommittee update relatively soon, um, and that will be scheduled um, when it makes sense to do that. Um, we have the California Children Data Protection Working Group um, appointee um, when that is when it's the appropriate time for that. Um, we also have some board practices and policies um, to discuss, although we've been putting these in place steadily. We have a good stable of them. Um, but we will have a uh, need to discuss a couple in September. We will certainly need to discuss policies for agency funded travel and related speaking by board members um, uh, uh, and what the policy needs to be around that. Um, as mentioned, we've been putting these in place steadily. And just to give you a heads up, um, uh, Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay um, uh, uh, will be working to collect those into a handbook. We had a start a long time ago, um, so we'll collect those um, into a handbook. I think it's um, a good time to do that. We have a good um, set of policies now, um, and we'll also hopefully be welcoming a new board member soon. We welcomed Mr. Mark Taggart um, as well, and so having um, something um, for everybody to use, um, I hope will be helpful, so please keep an eye out for that. Um, uh, so that's my running list. Um, please let me know if I missed anything or if you have additional agenda items. Um, to suggest. No? Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sabo, um, is there any public comment? Does anyone wish to suggest additional agenda items? This is public comment for agenda item 13, future agenda items. If you'd like to speak on this item at this time, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or press star nine if you're dialing in by phone.
Again, this is for agenda item 13, future agenda items. This is the final boarding call for agenda item 13, future agenda items. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Sabo and everyone. I'm gonna be very short, but very sincere. Our next and final agenda item is number 15, adjournment. I would like to very sincerely thank everyone my fellow board members, staff, and members of the public for all of your contributions to the meeting and the board's work um, through, I think, a very packed, substantive, and long meeting today on a Friday. I want to express my special thanks to everyone um, for all you've been providing to the agency and for the public um, through you know, a, a very long day. So thank everyone for that. Um, and may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I so move. Thank you. I second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to um, adjourn the meeting. Mr. Sapo, would you please perform the roll call vote on whether the board approves that motion? Yes. The motion is to adjourn. Board member De La Torre. Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board member Lay. Aye. Lay, aye. Board member McTaggart. Chair Urban. Aye. Urban, aye. Madam Chair, you have three ayes. Thank you very much. The motion has been approved by a vote of three to zero, and this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board stands adjourned. Thanks, everybody.